second day of the conference. We are really thrilled and excited to kick it off with Martin Schneider from Stanford University telling us how conventional or unconventional green monetary policy is. Don't work with Melina Papuzzi and uh, Monica Piazzesi. Martin, can you hear us? Yes. Perfect. Hi, so, everyone. Welcome uh, virtually to Helsinki. We are really happy to have you. And you have uh, 35 minutes and then 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Thank you. OK. Uh, good. So everything working with the sound? Yeah. Here you so, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks very much for uh, putting me uh, on the conference. Uh, and uh, I'm really sorry that I can't be there with you. That uh, would have been a lot of fun. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Melina and Monica, uh, and it's on green monetary policy. So we ask basically a, a question that's hotly debated, which is, uh, should central banks buy green bonds? And you see various types of opinions in the on Twitter and in the newspapers and so on. Uh, some people say, well, the central bank doesn't have a mandate for this. Shouldn't it rather do market neutrality? Other people say, but uh, many large asset managers are now moving towards ESG. So why not the central bank, which also runs a large portfolio? So what we're going to do in this paper is um, we'll provide evidence on the footprint of the ECB's uh, corporate bond purchasing program, the CSPP. And then we're going to offer a theoretical framework for thinking about you know, the, the color of uh, monetary policy. So let me uh, preview the findings. So uh, on the empirical side, we show that the ECB CSP purchase program favors dirty firms. And we have, there are two parts to the argument. Uh, first, we compare the ECB bond portfolio to a market portfolio of equity and debt, or sort of all the capital in the economy. And we show that the ECB portfolio is tilted towards relatively high emission sectors. And then the second uh, argument is uh, about the announcement effect on the cross-section of yield spreads, where we show that uh, this announcement generated a larger drop for riskier firms, uh, as well as for liquid firms, and in particular for firms that are dirtier. So our theory consists of a growth model with uh, uh, both climate externalities and financial frictions. And uh, importantly, it's consistent with the factor structure that we observe in bond premia as well as in these uh, CSPP announcement effects. And the key mechanism then is that a purchase program lower market prices for market risk as well as for climate risk. And then kind of the central point uh, that the model makes is that if you have a QE program that works, that is, it has macro effects, then it's, also, it's going to have also cross-sectional effects. And so this, this idea that you could be market neutral is really quite elusive. We'll show that uh, market neutrality typically is not possible. Um, so what should the central bank do? So that depends crucially on uh, the availability of other instruments, as one would expect. And so if a carbon tax is available, then the optimal program should basically focus on financial frictions alone. And it, it might... Uh, respond to the climate transition as that shows up in financial frictions, but, uh, but no more than that. In the absence of a carbon tax, in contrast, then trading a climate risk factor is something that can be interesting um, uh, just for environmental policy reasons. Okay, so uh, let me also say that in this talk, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to present a simpler version of the model that does not have uh, uh, endogenous capital structure, which is something that uh, to, to understand the data is kind of interesting, but but we do in the paper. Okay, so let me jump into the uh, empirics. And so uh, the ECB uh, corporate bond purchase program was announced in March uh, 2016, current holdings about 350 billion euros. Um, eligible bonds are those of euro area, uh, euro area non-financial firms with a good enough credit rating. And the implementation is basically bonds purchased in proportion to outstandings. And, and this is the idea that was given for this is the, to be market neutral. Um, 
And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to compare this uh, bond portfolio to a, a market portfolio of equity and debt. And we do this at, at the sectoral level where we can construct it, these portfolios. So um, we're going to measure actual ECB holdings. So there, there's some sort of contemporaneous work that looks at eligibility criteria only where we actually look at the proprietary data on the holdings including, and this is kind of some of the busy work for the paper, is we look at uh, what uh, firms issue to kind of auxiliary finance companies, but they're actually non-financial uh, corporations. Um, and we compared these holdings to uh, three measures of market portfolio. The results I'm going to show here are going to be based on a measure from capital income from yours that the paper has the others that are quite similar. And we'll also use uh, the sectoral scope one emissions from Eurostat. Okay, so here's a picture of uh, market portfolio shares. So think of this as a measure of debt plus equity in the non-financial sectors. And it's it's relatively coarse. So there's services and then we split up manufacturing into dirty, which there's a kind of higher emission intensities, oil, coke, chemicals, etc. Uh, and then a couple of other uh, smaller sectors. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of services and, and some of the other stuff. And when you uh, contrast this with the ECB holdings, then uh, you get uh, much larger weights, relatively speaking, on these uh, smaller sectors that, um, that, that are due manufacturing and utilities. Okay? And it turns out those are the sectors that also produce larger shares of emissions in the, in the European economy. Okay? And so, I mean, this is... Uh, Perhaps uh, not surprising to everyone because the, the, those who teach uh, corporate finance might, like me, use uh, as an example of what is a firm that uh, has a uh, uh, high book, um, a lot of collateral and can easily issue bonds is a power plant. Right? And so that's kind of what, what we see here that if you buy bonds in proportion to outstandings, you're going to buy more of these relatively uh, dirtier firms. Okay, so that's uh, part one of the evidence uh, is that the portfolio is tilted towards um, these, these uh, dirtier firms. Um, now let's talk about uh, price effects. Okay, so those are not necessarily connected, but uh, so we want to uh, study the post announcement changes in bond spreads uh, by group of firm. So we're going to combine firm level yields and outstandings and bond characteristics from the CSDB database with firm level emissions intensities from Urgentum. Um, and uh, we're going to make a couple of pictures uh, with all the same structure where along the uh, uh, x-axis we're going to have the policy spread, uh, the pre-policy spread, so the spread uh, in February 2016. And then we're going to look at the change in the spread around the policy, by which we mean the median March to August uh, minus the, the spread in February. And this is done here for uh, groups of uh, eligible bonds. And this is a bin scatter. Okay? And so the, the fact is that um, this is a regression line with a negative slope. Riskier bonds experience a relatively larger spread decline. And this is something that uh, has been pointed out uh, in, in the literature before. Um, now, uh, the other thing that uh, comes out uh, quite clearly when you do it this way, is that large ineligible firms, those are the red dots, um, and by this we mean sort of top 10% in issuance, uh, so about more than uh, 800,000 euro, the pattern is really very similar. And so these, are, th these groups of firms uh, behave uh, very similar to the eligible ones. Um, which means that we need to understand why there's kind of these spillovers to other firms. Okay. Um, uh, whereas if you add ineligible bonds by smaller issuers, there the effects are notably uh, smaller. Okay, So the, these green dots, uh, there's just not a lot of action. Um, so what I'm going to do now to, to, uh, is, is actually f combine together these uh, uh, eligible and large ineligible firms. And I'm going to say that the common denominator is they're kind of liquid. Okay, So these are guys that are highly rated or they're large, and so they're, they're liquid. Those are the magenta points. Um, and, and then I can break out from this group uh, the ones that are uh, dirty in the sense of top 10% by emission intensity, and those are the black guys. Okay, And then you see there that the effect is substantially larger. So, so that's the that's the price evidence. Uh, there is uh, more uh, kick 
uh, of the program's impact on the dirty firms. Okay, so now, uh, how do we think about this? Uh, how, how do we understand these patterns uh, and, and relate them to kind of how to think about welfare? So we're going to use for this uh, a growth model uh, with uh, climate externalities uh, to think about uh, inefficiencies due to uh, the, um, to this, uh, environmental issues and uh, financial frictions. Uh, we're going to start with the representative household who has preferences over some final consumption good and uh, inelastically supplies one unit of labor. There's a final good that's made from intermediate goods. There's end sectors with lots of varieties, the CAS aggregators so over a fairly standard uh, set up uh, in this uh, misallocation literature with heterogeneous firms. And then we're going to have uh, th these individual firms are going to be firm specific climate externalities in production. So there'll be a production function that's got TFP that uh, declines with a, a measure of the, of the environment, they call it temperature, ADA, and uh, temperature uh, increases with the emissions uh, that the firms uh, produce. And emissions are some, here something that's just proportional to output. Okay? So um, you have then that uh, when, when lots of output by dirty firms gets produced in PRT, then PRT plus one TFP will be, be lower. And so this is sort of a minimal way to get uh, what these integrated assessment models do, where uh, production today has an externality through temperature on the, on the production tomorrow. Okay, so that's sort of step one. That's kind of one imperfection. And uh, now the other thing we want to put is uh, uh, financial frictions. And um, so there is many ways in, in which those show up. And we want to take an approach that sort of gets at the ass essence of many different things, such as the effect of risk on intermediaries and the uh, uh, surge frictions and over the counter markets and so on. And so what we propose for this is, is the device what we call holding costs. So we're going to say that holding assets of any type requires resource costs in unit of final goods. And, and they capture all sorts of reasons why assets are undesirable and therefore pay premium. Okay? So it could be risk, illiquidity, and so on, anything that makes the asset uh, icky. Um, the cost is asset specific, so we can have some assets that are less desirable, then they're going to in equilibrium or pay higher premium. Um, and uh, for now, this could reflect either household preferences or intermediation, both uh, di types of dislike of uh, these characteristics generate premium. Um, and so in particular, we, we subsume here also uh, just, just aversion to risk. Uh, so this is going to be a deterministic model. Um, where uh, we want to capture all these things in a unified way, that, that, that's very tractable. Um, now, uh, in order to make contact to the data, we assume that the cost depends on uh, exposure of uh, the, the representative household to a vector of uh, F factors, which is much smaller than the number of uh, firms uh, in. And so the idea there is, is, is the usual, that uh, assets with similar risk and liquidity characteristics uh, tend to be closed substitutes. So for example, in our previous work on, on banks, we've mapped these bank portfolios to exposures to two factors. One is the interest rate factor, one is the credit risk factor. And there's large empirical literature on kind of having small number of factor models and equities, including uh, liquidity type factors. And then, um, most uh, relevant for this current uh, paper, there is this recent evidence uh, that is still developing of a, of a climate factor that, for example, Pastor and Stambo and Bolton and Kasperchik have uh, proposed. Um, now, um, oftentimes, the, 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 the factor, if the factor structure comes from risk, then it's, uh, it's a property of the covariance matrix of returns. Say it has a, a strong first principle component. Here, uh, we're going to capture the this, this same uh, economics with this cost function. So the factor structure is going to show up because of the shape of the cost, much like it would in a, in a hedonic pricing model of housing, for example. Okay? So that, that, that's the approach. And it, then it's kind of easier to, to have this and also have liquidity and everything part of the equation. Okay, so formally, um, we're going to say there is a per unit cost H um, of holding capital that depends on the private sector's overall factor exposure beta. Yeah. 
Um, where does this come from? Well, the exposure uh, of uh, cap holding capital Ki um, is described by some F uh, vector beta I, that's the, the capital I of firm I exposure. And then uh, for any portfolio, you could just calculate the average exposure uh, of the individual holdings. So for example, let's take the market portfolio of the entire capital stock that has an average exposure, which we call beta star, it's just the weighted average of the betas weighted with the individual capital holdings. And we're going to assume that this function H is convex in exposure. Um, and uh, that uh, allows for kind of increasing marginal cost of risk and uh, illiquidity. That's, that's going to be important. <laughs> okay. So what is in this context now? Uh, so th this is the environment, so far it's just the environment without any government. Okay. Now, what does a central bank purchase program do? So a central bank can buy portfolios of capital. And, and then, so here you see, you know, in, in, in the world, there's always bonds, and then there, and there's a capital structure decision that's kind of relevant, so we do that in the paper, but not here. Uh, so, so here, the central bank buys a portfolio of capital, um, uh, and it issues debt uh, in order to finance this program. There's no equity in the central bank, for simplicity. Um, and, and so then we can define the relative size of the program as uh, debt divided by the total capital stock. Um, and uh, much like for the private sector, we can calculate the exposure for the central bank as the uh, weighted average of the holdings, exposures, that is beta i's. And then we're going to say setting up a central bank and running it is not free. It also requires a holding cost. And that depends on how risky the central bank's uh, portfolio is or how, or how um, exposed to various uh, factors. Um, and, and so that this HG has a similar pr properties to H because it's something that's convex. Okay, now the uh, key thing of the central bank is that its debt uh, has zero exposure. Uh, this means that the purchase uh, program, uh, so this debt is then held by the private sector. There's a swap here of this uh, capital, which is exposed to this uh, zero exposure debt. <coughs> and so the, the purchase reduces the private sector exposure. It goes from uh, beta star to now beta equal to beta star minus uh, the central bank exposure times the size of the program delta. And so what you can do by setting up a central bank is uh, now restructure the total holding cost to society of this, of this capital uh, into this private sector piece where some uh, uh, exposure is, is removed because of the, the, there's now these reserves in the, in the financial system. Uh, but then you, ha you have the cost of the central bank. Okay. Notice that because all these betas are all ratios, uh, this is a cost returns intermediation technology. Okay, so let, let me sort of describe what, what's the role of the central bank here? What is, what is it supposed to capture? Uh, well, the central bank is special in that it can provide these uh, zero exposure, risk-free liquid assets or reserves okay, that help make the private sector safer or more liquid or generally uh, less exposed. Um, and this is supposed to capture a familiar theme from the literature, which is that the central bank is better able to commit to repay debt um, than the private sector, as long as its balance sheet is sufficiently small. And this is how a lot of the existing macro models of QE work. Right? And we capture this here with this cost. Uh, and then uh, the sufficiently small part can be accommodated by saying that this HG is convex. And so if you sort of put a lot of junk into the central bank, it becomes very costly. And so then, then let's not do that. Um, okay, let me also uh, say that this is a real model where the focus is really on investment, and in particular then sort of cross-sectional effects uh, and asset premia, uh, and, and that's most appropriate for kind of a, a medium run perspective. So here there's no um, you know, price stability objective, uh, sticky prices and stuff that, that one would like to have in a business cycle context. Here we're thinking, okay, there's this, this, the central bank decides to have a large balance sheet for a decade. Uh, what does it do to financial markets? Okay, and so what does, uh, when is this effective? Uh, so, I mean, the framework in principle allows for um, a frictionless benchmark where nothing happens. So I suppose you choose uh, the H and the HG functions to be linear with the same slope. Then if you 
uh, do some purchase program where you put some stuff out of the, say, the commercial banks into the central bank, that doesn't really change anything. There's a kind of a Ricardian equivalence result. Say there's the, the risk is you know, wherever you have it and what intermediary, that doesn't really matter. Um, in contrast, if the uh, H functions are convex, strictly convex, then um, by issuing a little bit of the zero exposure central bank debt, you can lower the total cost and more so if the H function is uh, relatively steeper. Okay, so, so this is say, this could stand in for if the, um, the health of the financial sector is not so good, then this is more effective. Um, okay, so then that raised the question, I mean, which is it, right? So there, there's, a, we can write a cost function and then lots of stuff could happen. And so, uh, so here I, I wanna show you that uh, we can figure out uh, important features of these H functions by looking at the effect of the purchase program on premium and spreads. And so let me, um, but for that, what I need is uh, to go away just uh, from a technology to an equilibrium concept where I can talk about prices that I haven't done that yet. So let me do that. All right, so um, in order to decentralize this, we're going to introduce private intermediaries. Think of competitive firms that are owned by households and they choose uh, holdings of capital. And uh, they do shareholder value maximization, where they have to take into account these uh, holding costs. And there is a discount factor uh, that, that they use in this discount. And then you can take a first order condition for firm I capital holdings uh, that lets the, the return uh, equal to the discount rate plus the marginal holding cost. And because it's all these ratios, it has this, this uh, form. Um, and now uh, it's convenient to define uh, a zero beta uh, asset, and let's say RF is the return on a zero exposure asset, such as central bank reserves, that we said that the, the beta is zero. And then what we get is that the return premium, that is the difference between the return on firm I, say, and the, uh, the zero exposure rate, uh, is the gradient of H, so the marginal holding cost, times beta I. And so you see that then there, this, uh, this uh, gradient that acts like a market price of factor exposure, and then it's times the exposure. And so the marginal holding cost in this framework is what generates premium. And that those could be, for, so then we said what the factors could stand in for risk or liquidity and so on. So you can have risk premium, liquidity premium and so on. And it's all about the, the shape of the cost in the sense of the, um, the this gradient, the, mar the marginal cost. Okay, so let me, uh, put the, the remaining ingredients and we close the model. The, there's uh, these intermediate good firms, uh, they hire labor and they sell goods and they pay a carbon tax for, uh, possibly that's per unit of emissions and they maximize profits. And so you're gonna get a first order condition for capital that sets the, the cost of capital or from the other side with the return on the firm equal to the marginal product of capital net of the carbon tax. Um, final good firms standard by intermediate goods and, and sell final goods and there's a government um, th there we we, uh, we really consolidate the central bank and the, um, uh, the treasury and there's some lump sum transfers to make sure the, the government budget can, can hold and other than that is all competitive agents optimized markets clear okay so that's the uh, now I, ha I have an equilibrium and I have uh, also uh, I can talk about prices and, uh, and premium um, and so now I can ask uh, what do central bank purchases do in this economy um, okay so in order to, to say that I will combine uh, firm and intermediary first order conditions and then so there's so we said the marginal product of capital net of the carbon tax got to be equal to the cost of capital or the return and then that return from the intermediaries problem is the zero beta rate plus this marginal holding cost. And so I want to first think about kind of the macro effects. What, so, so suppose we integrate over uh, all of these, these I's, and I'm, I'm not putting formulas, it would be messy, but just think about so this, this, this applies to all these I's. Um, so then, uh, I mean, what, what happens here on aggregate? Well, if you have these convex H functions, then if you've got private sector exposure, that increases premium and increases the cost of capital and lowers investment. And then if you have a purchase program that can uh, lower exposure, that's going to lower the factor prices, lower the premium, and so it stimulates investment. And that captures just what's familiar from many macro models of QE. 
Um, now, it's not important that all of the factor prices are necessarily affected there. You could have, say, the price of liquidity could be less affected, uh, price of risk more affected. Uh, but but the, key, the key thing is that at the end of the day, the, the marginal holding costs go down uh, from the purchase program, and, and that stimulates. Okay, so that's uh, the macro. So we want it, want it there. Um, so it connects to, to how people think about QE. Now comes the cross-section. That's what we're really interested in. And so this equation now with the eyes, uh, now focusing on the eyes that are there, um, we can say that this uh, firm eyes market portfolio share uh, is uh, relatively lower if its marginal cost is higher. Okay? Um, and so what happens now is that this, this private sector factor exposure can be a source of misallocation that the central bank can address. Um, so if the central bank... Um, does a purchase program is going to change the relative uh, magnitudes of these marginal holding costs across firms, and that is going to have effects. Okay, now, uh, how much uh, wiggle room does the central bank have? So here, our point is uh, is limited because the factor structure uh, is there, and it makes the QE a relatively blunt instrument. Okay, so. Uh, the the central bank, like what the formula shows, is that the central bank affects individual returns only via these uh, market prices of factor exposure. Right? These betas are given to the, to the firm. And so you can't really fine tune, you can't uh, pick your favorite firm and give that a uh, uh, goodie or something. Um, Instead, you, you can change these market prices of factor exposure, and that affects then the returns on all the assets exposed to the same factors. And this gives then a natural story for, uh, for example, you know, when you have eligible firms and you change their, then you, you change market price of risk. It's also going to affect ineligible firms. So this spillover that's to be expected. Um, so, so that, so that there's this important sense in which this is a blunt instrument. Now, it, it's not uh, for for the for what we're interested in here with this this climate policy is is uh, is not all lost because uh, I mean the central bank can still target groups of firms that have similar exposure by trading in factors, and the, and the example there is is the you know green purchases can increase uh, this. Uh, or can decrease the, the, the market price of the climate risk. Yeah. Um, and so, so the presence of this, uh, of this factor for which uh, Lubos and, uh, and um, uh, Bob Stambo and, and Marcin and, and Patrick Bolton found evidence and what we have found in the bonds, that, that's, that sort of shows that there's a force of, of moving these, these green uh, factor prices. So uh, let me... Uh, Go back now to the to the evidence, and so, so I've I've, uh, I've given you the setup. I've shown how the uh, what, what is the role of the program. Now, how how can we think about these patterns in this in these announcement effects that, that I talked about? Um, so for that, uh, kind of the minimal approach is to say say there's three factors. Okay? So the spreads reflect market risk, some sort of overall um, state of the economy type thing, and then climate risk and liquidity. Um, and uh, I, I just line them up as one, two, three. Um, and then uh, let's do groups of firms that differ in factor loadings. I want to say the li what I called before the liquid firms, which is eligible and large ineligible, do not load on the liquidity factor. So those are the guys that kind of trade it a lot. Uh, and then this liquidity factor is not there. And then I have the small ineligible firms that load on the liquidity. And I've got the high emissions firms, including the liquid ones, that load on the climate factor. Um, and then uh, I, I'm going to say, well, the, the central bank purchases lower the prices of the of the market risk and the climate risk because that's uh, that's sitting in the intermediaries, and then uh, what they, if that gets swapped with reserves, that's that lowers this. Whereas liquidity of small firms that's affected less. And with that pattern, I can generate uh, this policy response that I saw in in the picture before. So I mean, I'm taking differences of the equation at the top. Then I've got uh, the, these kind of three changes, and uh, so what we want to hit is this picture, uh, the, the picture before, with the small and eligible green, and then the, the clean liquid uh, pink and the black dirty. Okay, and so <clears throat> the clean liquid firms we assume load only on the um, market risk, and so there uh, they should lie on a straight line with the slope minus the change in the market price of risk pi one. Um, 
For the dirty firms, we have a larger response because the uh, market price of the climate risk also changes, and there is this additional exposure beta 2. And then uh, for the small firms, uh, there is this, this additional liquidity. So liquidity contributes um, to the initial spread, and therefore any changes in, this, uh, in these risk factors that, that the central bank uh, puts in place affect these firms less. Yeah, so that's sort of a narrative uh, that, that accounts for the picture using this factor pricing logic um, and, and these, these groups of firms. Okay, so let me comment on uh, market neutrality, which is so. So as I mentioned, um, the the ECB's policy initially was uh, was announced uh, that this is the goal, and, and the idea was that we're going to purchase uh, in proportion to our standings with the idea of not changing relative prices. Um, and so the way that uh, we want to think about it in the context of this model uh, of neutrality is something that is a purely macro policy that does not have effect in the cross section. Right? But th what that means in, in uh, this setting is that um, you basically do not change relative cost of capital um, so that you don't change the market portfolio. You might sort of do overall investment, aggregate investment might, might be affected, but not the, not the cross section. And so formally, you, you kind of you start to start from some less fair equilibrium with no purchase program. You fix and that has a certain market portfolio, and then you could ask uh, if you do the comparative static with the purchase program, how does the uh, market portfolio change, or, or does, when does it not change? Okay, so if we ask that, then I mean, looking at the equations here, um, you see that uh, a market neutral um, purchase program uh, typically doesn't exist. Okay? That's just a matter of counting the equations and the unknowns. Is because what the central bank can do is it affects this small number of market prices of risk. Um, but there's lots of firms, and the, all the firms differ in these betas. So, so the thing, so think about say, say there was only one market price of risk, then you just shift around that thing, but there's all these different firms, all these different betas are going to be affected differently uh, by, by the policy. And so, so this 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 idea of market neutrality that's something that's just elusive. That in, in a world where there's factor pricing, you can't do that. Um, okay. So instead, what, well, what what should we do? Um, so let me briefly talk about uh, optimal policy. Um, and so uh, uh, this, as I mentioned, uh, depends a lot on uh, whether there is a carbon tax or not. Because here we've got these two imperfections, right? We've got the financial friction. And, uh, and we've got the, uh, the climate externality. Um, and so let me first talk about the optimal uh, purchase program when there is a carbon tax. And so then there you basically, there's two principles. First, you want to equate the marginal cost of uh, the central bank, that, that's the, sort of the gradient of HG with respect to beta, uh, to the factor prices. And so it's, it's sort of like, the, the, the market price of risk is, the, is the, the valuation by the marginal investor, and then this, the central bank, uh, as a player, optimally should have the same market price of risk. Martin, you um, have about three more minutes. This, what's that? You have about three more minutes. Yes, that's good. That's perfect. Yeah, that's more. Um, so uh, now, what this means is that the optimal uh, program typically is not neutral. Because what, what it will do is is kind of uh, so so it'll it'll make the these these uh, gradients the same and kind of push the exposures of the private sector down. But then it's, it's always going to help the exposed firms more. So this idea of this market neutrality that that is not typically. Uh, the, the part of an optimal um, uh, policy, uh, the optimal program in an economy with financial frictions. Yeah. Um, second point is that uh, you want to equate the marginal benefit of uh, reducing the private exposure, that's the left-hand side in the second equation, uh, to the, uh, the fact that uh, you know, you've got to run the central bank, so there is a per unit cost of that. And uh, that basically is what in the model uh, pins down some sort of optimal size of the, of the central bank balance sheet. Now, the, uh, the key thing is that so this formula will, will be the same uh, whether or not you have climate externalities. It's always just this, this um, you want to uh, worry about the market prices of 
uh, exposure relative to the uh, gradient of the central bank's um, cost function. Um, this means that uh, the policy should reflect the color uh, only if this shows up as a financial friction. So say, for example, uh, there is now this transition, there's a lot of risk, and then that, that makes the, that hurts the banks, and then the, there's trouble. That, that, then, but, but there isn't sort of an active reason just because of the externality to change the nature of the, of the program. And this is related to what the public finance guys call the principle of targeting, is that if, when you have multiple tax instruments, then, um, and then, then the, the um, Pigouvian tax should take care of the externality and other, do other things. Uh, here, I mean, it's not exactly a tax problem because it's got it's a, it's a GE problem with a um, purchase program, but but the, the, the logic is the same. Now, in contrast, if you don't have a carbon tax, uh, and uh, arguably that that's the case in lots of economies, then what we've seen is that when you trade the the, the climate factor, um, you can affect the uh, relative cost of capital of uh, dirty firms, okay? and so that can then be something that uh, that helps reduce emissions. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. Let me just go back on the message. So I have argued that uh, the uh, purchase program that we've seen um, uh, from the ECB favors dirty firms. And uh, uh, we've written a, a, a growth model with climate externality and financial frictions to think about this. And the main thing that, that, uh, that we've learned from this is that um, there is always a footprint. Right? If you have something that, re that has macro effects, then there are always these cross-sectional effects. And then we got to start thinking about what they are. Um, and uh, as we're seeing this evidence of a climate factor, there is a way to maybe exploit them in a useful fashion. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Martin, for a super topical and insightful presentation. So now we have about 10 minutes for questions. Let's see who has uh, the first question. So maybe while you're still uh, kind of formulate your question. Martin, I have actually one for you. So like this uh, asset pricing uh, and, uh, purchase uh, uh, program, did it have like a sharp announcement date? So like I was wondering like, you know, in this literature oftentimes people <coughs> also look at like, you know, high frequency uh, announcement and uh, changes in spread. So I think you looked at, uh, you know, longer term trends and so like Sydney uh, told us yesterday that indeed actually, you know, oftentimes the effect of monetary policy, we indeed want to look at longer term trends, but can you actually also zoom into more high frequency changes? Yeah, so that, I mean, that, that's an interesting thing to do. So here, I mean, we were sort of interested in part on the, uh, so, so high frequency is nice because it's clean uh, in terms of there is certainly not anything else going on, uh, but then also uh, it's potentially transitory. And, and here we're sort of interested in the effect on investment. Okay, So this is why there's always a trade-off. Um, there is a, uh, I can advertise a great job market candidate coming from Stanford uh, this year, Matteo Leombroni, who studies uh, ECB uh, uh, purchasing programs and does sort of more of a high frequency approach and shows that like, some of these facts about uh, Credit risk uh, uh, being being affected and riskier firms being uh, favored more are are also present in, in high frequency specification. So that's certainly something that can be explored further. Something else, actually, I was wondering through the lens of your model, can you actually also comment? Like some uh, sometimes people also say, well, maybe we want to think about differential capital requirements. Like, you know, it's not uh, directly, uh, you know, I guess uh, uh, in your model, but uh, could this be uh, uh, an instrument by the central bank to, uh, to partially, you know, substitute for a carbon tax and also like in case it, you know, would uh, materialize via financial frictions in your setting? Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, the, the basic mechanism is through the cost of capital, right? It's all about relative cost of capital. And so any tool that can affect those is, uh, is on the table. Um, if, if you want to think about a world without a carbon tax, it, I think, I mean, so, okay, so I don't, in a world with a carbon tax, I, I think these kind of principle of targeting logic will, will happen for many tools. Um, but if in a world without a carbon tax, then anything that uh, can affect the relative cost of capitals is uh, interesting to think about. And then, the, and the capital requirements, I guess, um, th that would be something where you could even 
more directly tune it towards particular firms without going through this factor pricing uh, route where you have to where you can only target uh, factors that are there. So that, that seems like an interesting thing to think about. So we have a question by Esa. Uh, Esa Jokipo from the Bank of Finland. Thank you very much for your very uh, interesting, insightful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I would have a question of uh, the relation of your work uh, with some, some of the recent literature, if I may. So uh, uh, I remember a paper by L L Lubos Pasteur. I, I think it uh, came out already. Uh, and uh, if I understood correctly, so he, he looks at a little bit similar things in a market equilibrium, like if uh, private investors set some criteria, like what they would like to see in their portfolios in, in terms of uh, uh, emphasis on, on green firms uh, with respect to brown firms. Uh, but uh, if I remember correctly, he doesn't have the central bank in the model. But uh, if you happen to... Uh, include that in your literature review. So how would you sort of compare the, your findings with, uh, with his, uh, thank you. That's a great question, yeah. So um, sh should I answer directly or do you want to collect questions? Uh, we have another one Take by Gaetan also like, uh, maybe let's, uh, and then one uh, behind, so let's collect and then. Hi. Um, thinking about this kind of policies, I always wonder why the central bank actually buy this stuff instead of, for example, using a collateral framework to uh, to incentivize the, the private sector to buy this stuff. Um, would be the effect the same? I mean, do you have any? Does your analysis give a, an argument in favor of collateral framework rather than direct asset purchases? <laughs> Like, uh, collect one more. Thank you, uh, Louis Brandon from the IMF. Uh, so, in your in your model, the perhaps the, the, the key finding, right, is that the the first best is that you have a carbon tax, right, and then the central bank doesn't have to worry about the externality, right. But if you don't have a carbon tax, then then the policy, the the constraint of no policy becomes. Uh, you also accommodate for that. But in fact, the, the authorities that set carbon taxes and monetary policy are different, right? One is a tax authority or, or the legislator, and the other one is a central bank. And you can have a strategic interaction between the two, whereby if you don't have a carbon tax, and as a central bank you intervene in the market to accommodate the externality, you make it even less likely that you, you'll have a carbon tax in the future. So have you thought about incorporating that in the model? Uh, or any thoughts would be welcome, thanks. Okay, Martin, please. Okay, yeah, so, so, so great questions. Uh, so first about uh, the, the, the Pastor Stumbo paper, and more generally, so there, there's sort of emerging literature in which there is a taste for green assets, right? And because we were seeing all this push into ESG and, and a lot of private sector money goes into this, we've, all, we've been doing a, a survey of uh, German households actually, uh, which, which there's a lot of interest now in pensions uh, with with some green features. Um, so, so the way um, the way I think about that in the so is that so this approach that I uh, propose with, with with these holding costs is uh, is is actually sort of quite useful to build that in uh, because in a way this taste for green is just another reason why people dislike certain assets. And or or like, so, um, and so so the way that you would do that is you would say that there's sort of an additional uh, uh, factor that has to do with taste for um, uh, greenness of the firm, and this is also the way that uh, Lubosch and, and and Bob do this, um, and and then uh, so the way that I would think about that factor is that that is not something that so so that would affect premium as it does in their model. Um, but uh, those premia would not change when the central bank uh, does anything, because so, or, so, so that that component of the overall premia would not change because th there is the taste and people dislike uh, the, the the brown firm and they do that whether or not the central bank holds the stuff. Right? So then we wouldn't expect to see uh, effects of uh, policy on that component. Um, and so I, I think this is in, in that it's possibly an important force towards uh, 
shifting capital away from brown firms towards green firms, if this uh, becomes more important in the economy, this, this trend. Um, but it, it, I, I view it as relatively orthogonal to the, this uh, monetary policy, I mean, bond purchase angle. But uh, I mean, for say for a quantitative evaluation of overall sort of you know the, how the emissions change, this this is probably quite an important uh, element. Um, okay, so then about the collateral framework, that's uh, that's also interesting. So yeah, so there the, the way I think about that is that um, you're kind of providing. Uh, institution, to, you, you're making it more convenient to uh, hold uh, securities, particular securities, if they can be used as collateral. And so that's a tool that allows relatively more fine tuning because you could just label, in principle, you could just label a bunch of things and it doesn't, uh, then the effect doesn't depend on the factor exposure directly, but rather on just what you label. And so in some sense, this is the more direct uh, tool um, then the question is, uh, and, and the sort of quantitative question is, how much uh, difference does it make, and, and, and relative to a large-scale asset purchase program? But but in terms of fine-tuning and sort of picking, say say you wanted to um, pick out particularly uh, smaller firms that that do certain things that you like. I mean, I'm not that I'm necessarily advocating this, but but that that could be done with a collateral tool and not so easily with a with a purchase program because of the blunt instrument nature of these purchases. Um, okay, and then I mean, yeah. So the uh, on the strategic interaction and more generally, I mean, I think the um, uh, the fact that there is um, many chefs working on the meal uh, in, in the climate uh, area and then there's these different um, uh, different regulators thinking about this this is uh, is important and uh, it would be good to think about I mean for uh, yeah I, I don't have a don't have a so it's, it's very interesting to think about this as, as a kind of a policy game of the type of things that have been done for like treasury versus central bank. So that seems, seems interesting to think about. I mean, to me, sort of the most immediate thing would be to, uh, I mean, maybe too much of a US perspective, just to say that, suppose that uh, we can say that uh, very little will ever happen in, in the direction of a carbon tax uh, from Congress. Um, what else can be done, and what would be the, the optimal program, optimal sort of second best uh, initiative be? Uh, so that, and that's we start thinking about that. Okay, unfortunately, we've already reached our time limit, Martin. Thank you so much for uh, you know a great talk, and uh, the, those answers certainly elucidated and helped us understand the topic even better. So, like, let's offer a round of applause to Martin. Thanks, everyone. Now let's uh, continue with uh, Gaetano telling us about um, asset purchases and inflation default risk in uh, noisy financial markets. OK. Does it work? Yeah. OK. Thank you very much for the invitation. So this is a joint work with uh, Carlo Galli at the, uh, Carlos Tercero. Okay, I don't have to spend much time to convince you that asset purchases were large. So uh, between 20 and 30% of uh, sovereign debt is held at central banks. And I don't have to spend time to convince you that, in fact, uh, the problem famously, as, as Bernanke said, the problem with QE is that it, it seems working in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. So. Uh, as a profession, we, we are trying now to understand a, a little bit more uh, through which mechanism these asset purchases may work. So as a purchase works in practice, what does it mean? I mean, I just want to uh, mention three points taken from a, a recollection by Krishnamurti. Uh, if we look at case-based, so when uh, in some specific market, some specific date when the asset were purchased, we see returns going down we see not much moving apart these returns in these markets. So it seems like asset purchases is working through a narrow channel rather than broad channel. 
and certainly we see some state contingent. That is, the asset purchase is very effective when the economy is, the, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, there is distress, and they're particularly effective, and since nothing happens really when in normal times, or I mean, in less not normal times. What in theory? So my way to, uh, um, to recollect uh, all these models is that, uh, so there are two extremes. There is the macro view, starting from Wallace neutrality result, that has a benchmark where it works on general equilibrium, frictionless environment, uh, as a purchase are completely irrelevant. On the other extreme, we have what I call like a finance view, that is like uh, models that aim at replicating the movement in the yield curve, very partial equilibrium without many macro implication, okay? And in between these two, there are a continuum of models, okay? I, th I think there are many models, many details. If I, I have to tell you what are the two cornerstones of a theory about asset purchases, I will say some degree of heterogeneity, can be structural or can be uh, beliefs, and limits to arbitrage, that is some segmentation of, of the financial market. In general, I think it's important we clarify the mechanism because all these model, macro-ish models, giving the insight that in the end QE is, is operating some sort of fiscal-like redistribution, okay? You may think uh, across households, high MPC, low MPC, or unconstrained firms, unconstrained, to constrained firm, uh, banks, or in the worst of cases, uh, make a case of financial dominance from household to the, to, the, to the fiscal authorities. Okay, so I think one problem for central bank is really justifying it as a proper monetary tool instead of uh, a substitute for some sort of fiscal redistribution that the economy will, will need. Okay, this is one slide about the debate. What do we do? How do we contribute to that? So in this, in this paper, we, we present a, a new mechanism that we qualify as tight in the sense that it's based on the, these two elements uh, I told you about. So heterogeneity is an heterogeneity, not structural, but in terms of beliefs. So people are the same, but just they have different opinions. Um, and there is a, a, a limits to arbitrage in the sense that uh, no one can buy the old market, okay? So there are limits to how much you can buy. It's tight in the sense that if I take out one of these elements, then I get asset purchase neutrality. So both are essential in this sense it's tight. And I think a nice contribution is really to see that very clearly. And if I have to summarize, the mechanism, okay, so it is in this line that is quite dense. I'm going to, to, to tell you a bit more about this. So asset purchases impact the distribution of the difference between price and fundamental. So there is this paper by Alba E. Elvig Swiski, I think is forthcoming in the Journal of Finance, that really um, uh, characterize um, the, what they call a wedge between the price, the market price, and an expected fundamental in markets, in financial markets, where there is heterogeneity limit to arbitrage, right? In which there is learning from prices. The fact that people learn from the price um, uh, makes the price to deviate from what would have been the, uh, a, an assessment, a rational, an objective, let me say assessment of the fundamental. So there is always a wedge, okay? And our contribution is to show that QE is exactly, is working exactly because it's able to impact the distribution of these wedges, okay? So our contribution is really to open this dimension. And in which way? So initially, as you buy some asset, you, the, the rates in financial market goes down because asset purchase is able to cut states in which the market would undervalue bonds. Too much of asset purchases instead will have the effect, the other way, way effect of increasing rates because it cuts market uh, states in which the market is over-evaluating the asset. 
which is good because it's, when the market overvalues the asset, we have rates are low. They ask less to the government, okay? So we have this simple mechanism that I, uh, I have the ambition to present you in this presentation. I mean to explain you in this presentation. Uh, that really give you that optimal asset purchases in an interior, and it works exactly because it's able to impact this distribution in financial markets. And as a nice byproduct of this mechanism, it's naturally state dependent, okay? As observed in practice, so I will show you uh, that it has this feature that more uncertainty makes this more effective, uh, deeper crisis means this more effective, or higher likelihood of the crisis means, uh, makes this more effective. And in the paper, we have two applications. We take this mechanism, and then we, we discuss fiscal monitor interaction, or cases of endogenous default that are like uh, ty typical uh, uh, um, topics in this literature. I don't have the time in this presentation. My objective is to tell you something about the mechanism. But what is the, 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 the bottom line? The bottom line is that this new channel let you think about asset purchasing as working on the narrow financial markets in perfection. So it's not like operating any kind of fiscal redistribution. It's working because there is a feature, fundamental feature in financial market that is affected in particular states of distress by the purchases of the, of, of the, of the central bank, okay? And the heterogeneity that matters is an heterogeneity that cannot be taxed because you cannot, you don't tax optimism or pessimism, okay? Okay, let me go through the, the model. You will see it's, it's very simple. We, we try to give really the essence of the mechanism. Um, let's say there is a state of word, uh, theta, that can be high or low, okay? I want you to keep in mind that this state can be low, high inflation, or repayment of default state. One will be relevant for US, the other for, for the EU. And our financial market is really simple. So there is a continuum of risk neutral agent. Uh, they are maximizing consumption, okay, given some information set. I will tell you about the information set. What is this consumption is equal to what they buy of a bond was return is r theta, I will discuss it, plus one minus beta i, so beta i is the endowment, so is, is uh, what they buy of the bond. If they don't buy the bond, they can put this endowment in a, in a, in a technology, safe so technology, give them one, okay? So these guys are going into the market, are paying one, and they will get r theta. This is the payoff. So R is the return that is contracted, the nominal return that is a contractual term, okay? So the market give a price, the price is R, the return of the bond. But then it could be that inflation realized high, and so what you get in terms of real is R times high, uh, so um, uh, times theta, that in case of high inflation is something smaller than one. Okay, or the government may default, so you don't get R, you get less than R, you get something uh, uh, smaller than one. Okay, so think about theta high being one and theta low being smaller than one. This is the payoff, the real return. R times theta is the real return. Okay, and then they have some information. So the key point here is that the exposure to the bond is bounded. Okay, they can they may, may not short sell, and they cannot buy more than one. This is the, the limit to arbitrage. It's not that I can buy all the market there. So then, what is the information set? They see the price, they have a private signal, and, uh, uh, and there is a public signal, okay? So about theta, the state uh, of the world, it can be high or low, so it can be inflation or it can be default. And that's it, then there is a total supply of this nominal default government debt that is little b, so all the demand of the, of, of the agents has to equal supply. And it's a stochastic, uniformly distributed between zero and one, but we can take an, uh, other distributions. So what is asset purchases? So I'm just showing you a rule uh, that is very convenient to understand the mechanism. 
the rule is buy alpha of the realized S, okay? So the rule is I'm buying 30% of the supply that is on the market. This is the rule of the central bank, okay? And what is my uh, uh, object of interest is the expected real return, okay? So I want to know if the central bank by buying, by moving alpha from zero to positive has any impact on lowering the expected real return. This is the experiment, this is the model, okay? Okay, so how we solve this model, I just want to, to show you uh, how this model is solved. So agent, agents buy one if and only if the return that they expect is larger than one. If you expect a return larger than one, you buy one, otherwise you buy zero if it is lower than one, okay? So the strategy of in, this, in this environment uh, is defined by a threshold private signal, okay? So we, are, we receive private signal and this is the source of our heterogeneity. So whether I buy or not depends whether I'm optimistic relative to others. So if my signal is above a threshold, otherwise I don't buy. And so basically the mass of people that are buying is given by this cumulative um, distribution here. So is the distance between the threshold and the actual theta, okay? So all this is feature the uh, mass of people that are buying. And this is the equilibrium condition because demand has to equal supply, but which supply? The net supply. So one minus alpha times S, okay? So if there are uh, 100 billions of, uh, I don't know, uh, stock of, of bonds, one minus alpha is what is available uh, for private agents to purchase. And so once you have your equilibrium condition, you can say what is this threshold. This threshold in equilibrium has to be theta minus, here is the inverse of uh, a uniform that actually is a Gaussian. This is a nice trick I learned uh, to use. Uh, makes things uh, particularly tractable. Um, so this, think it as, as a Gaussian signal of theta, okay? And, uh, and the effect of the purchases is to truncate this distribution. Okay, this is a technical thing. We actually, to extend the analysis, we really had to handle truncations, and that was uh, the technical difficulty to, to do this analysis. But what you have to, to understand is that what we learn from prices is exactly this threshold, okay? Because um, the marginal agent, who is the marginal agent? Is the one that is indifferent. So it's exactly the one that received the private signal equal to the threshold. And if I observe the price, is as if I observe is the signal of the marginal agent, okay? So this is the thing to keep in mind, that the price is equal to the private signal of the marginal agent that has been picked up by market clearing. Okay, so now I want to show you how the mechanism works. So a first useful step is, okay, I take uh, Michael and I say, Michael, you observe a certain statistic on the market, Z, think it as the price, and you have some public information. How you evaluate the theta? So Michael is, is very good, so he does uh, conditional probabilities, so he can compute this, this object. If I ask Michael, what would have been the price that you will put on this market? He will uh, pick up this R star for which is expected return is equal to one. This is the, the price that Michael with the information will put on in, uh, for the bond. And actually, if I ask, okay, but then what will be the average bond return in this market, okay? No matter the distribution, no matter which environment we are talking about, there will be one anyway. So I'm just taking the R here and put, so multiplying by theta, then I'm just operating the low iterated expectation and show you that this is equal to this, so it will be one anyway. So in a market in which that is, uh, there is a market maker that shows, uh, that use the information, it will be one, there will be no distortion. But in the market instead in which the price is done by people that have private information, what is happening that 
the conditional expectation that matters for the price is the one in which the private information is always equal to Z. So Z is counted twice. You see, this is not a normal expectation. It's an expectation where I take X, Y, and Z, but X are always equal to Z. Okay, I'm jumping. Because the thing is, if people see the price is high, they become more optimist, but everybody become more optimist the same, but we want that someone is buying uh, something less. And so the price has to, uh, has to uh, move further, okay? And this is the extra, the extra thing. So if I redo what I showed you before, this is not always equal to one, and this is the wedge, okay? This is the wedge that is in the market. And this depends on, on, on the state Y and Z. So very quickly, what we do, we, we take this wedge and we look at the distribution of this wedge. What we are going to show is that this wedge is lower than one, okay, this lower than one for uh, when the market, for large enough prices for, for which the market overvaluates the, the Tita lottery. Instead, this larger than one when the market undervaluates the lottery, so for large enough S. So what does it mean? That I can show you uh, a distribution of this wedge, right, as a distribution over S. So Elvig and company, they characterize this point. They characterize the average wedge, and they show there is a wedge is positive, okay? What we are showing is that when the, market, when the uh, bank is purchasing some asset, what it's doing is moving probability away from the states of very high, um, uh, very high, very high prices. Why? Because by buying something, he buys this thing out of the hands of the people that are the most pessimistic, are the ones that will price very low, they are the ones that will depress a lot the rates. Okay. So by intervening, by intervening in the market, it's making extreme low realization, do not realize, and so is, is making this wedge work for the market, like for, for the, in the interest of the central bank, compressing rates. Okay, mm -hmm. so you see here the rate, the expected real return go from one below one, okay, because we are saying, if there are some pessimists that are driving the market very low by buying, I prevent them to buy the stock. And so if this very low um, state does not reveal, the market does not engender this amplification of this pessimism. Okay, but then by cutting further, at some point, I'm taking out of the market people that are relatively optimist and so this, this, uh, at some point, this is firing back and the real rates can, can go up. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm plotting here exactly the same picture where I show the difference between no wedge, which I have one always, and the case instead, the realistic case where people learn from prices, where by moving alpha, that is the, the stuff that you buy on the market, you are really compressing rates and there is a minimum you can achieve. And just as the last thing, I want to show some comparative statics when, uh, for example, here I'm giving more public information, okay? By giving more public information, you, um, you go into a situation in which asset purchases do not matter any longer. So if there is no heterogeneity in beliefs, asset purchases are neutral. This is the state contingent. If instead, here I'm giving more private information, then uh, again, so as a process become less effective when there is more information. When there is higher probability of uh, a crisis, so you are going towards the, the clear line here, as a process may be, is more effective in pushing down rates. And here is when the crisis is uh, it become deeper, okay? So it's going towards the, uh, the light gray. Asset purchases will become more effective, okay? So in conclusion, 
I know that it was a bit short time probably to explain this, but uh, the bottom line is that I want you to think that uh, there, is, there is a reason why QE should be done by central banks and is not a fiscal-like redistribution that has to do with uh, a, the mechanism of the financial markets. Okay, the financial markets, there is this momentum when people learn from prices that generate the wedge, and by doing asset purchases, the central bank is, is changing the distribution of this wedge, so it's impacting the function of this in a favorable, favorable way. Okay. Then we do application to endogenous default and uh, uh, fiscal monetary interactions, but there's no time to go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Gaetano. <laughs> but we do have uh, some time for questions. Who wants to start? So thanks a lot for uh, interesting presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I was maybe it's a bit outside of the of the model, but I was thinking that when central banks are, uh, intervene in the markets, uh, of course they want to affect them prices, but but eventually they want to impact on the state of the economy, say inflation or growth. And now, if I understood it correctly in this model, you know, the state, in a sense, is exogenous, so there is no really feedback from uh, prices to, to the state. So um, could you comment on that? Would it be possible sort of to, to build that uh, link into the, into the model? Thanks. So given your model structure, can you, can you study the questions related to TPI, this new instrument of the ECB? So mm. can you generate equil equilibrium where the beliefs are like diverging too much from the fundamentals? So is, is there a way of um, uh, doing this just by communication? Just could the rating agency say do the same job? Is there, is there anything about buying assets here that's different from just communicating? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks. Uh, f first question, so what I show you is the minimal ingredients uh, to, to explain the mechanism. In fact, what, what we, we have is, uh, so we also put this at work in a uh, setting in, uh, uh, of fiscal monetary interaction. I just want to highlight what is the key feature because it's responding to your, to your question. Because we combine default and inflation. So imagine the central bank is buying alpha of the bonds, okay? So in uh, the return on money, that is the value of his balance sheet, okay? Is going to depend alpha from the real return that is earning on the bonds, and one minus alpha on this storage uh, safe technology. I think it has, has uh, I don't know what. Uh, but the key point is, are going taxes to be fixed to ensure uh, the inflation target, or to ensure the financial budget of the fiscal authority? Because in the first case, the, the, um, uh, in the first case, the central bank will make loss, but then the taxes are rebated on the, bala on the um, balance sheet of the, of the Fed, of the, of the ESB, and inflation is not moving because the balance sheet has a, has a fixed value, right? But if you are in case of fiscal dominance, the fact that you are buying is generating inflation risk because the taxes are not insuring the balance sheet of, of, of the central bank and so the value of the central bank depends on the realization of the default. And so this is the feedback from the mechanism to the inflation, okay? And the nice feature about the fiscal monetary interaction with design is exactly that, that asset purchases, the cost of asset purchases is generating uh, uh, inflation risk in a case of fiscal dominance. But what we realize by working on this mechanism that you don't need fiscal dominance, even in, in a world with monetary dominance, asset purchases may be effective, okay? In my previous life as central banker, I would have been happy of writing a note in which we say, we don't need to give up with monetary dominance. Asset purchases is working because 
we are fixing in a particular way, in particular states, something that doesn't work in financial markets. And by the way, I didn't use any irrationality or it's just limit to arbitrage and the fact that people learn from prices. So it's a consequence of market clearing that is making uh, the system work. Then about your question, so here I, I took very simple way, so the rule is very simple, but one can play with that. So imagine you have a target of R. Instead of buying 30% of the asset, you, have, you, you want to target an R, you want like, to, to have a floor, for example, or a ceiling. I mean, that is doable. So we can do it, uh, or at least uh, MATLAB can do for us. Uh, we can give uh, an answer. But these are exactly the kind of exercises that this kind of model generates in terms of appetite. Um, and then the other question about communication. So communication, uh, I think the right picture is this one. So here I'm varying the, the precision of the public signal, okay? So from uh, black, to um, from black to gray, lit gray lit, uh, lighter gray, I'm giving more public information. I'm reducing the effectiveness of asset purchases. Okay, so, but this is public information about the default rate or inflation. By giving more information, I reduce because the impact of asset purchases because I reduce the heterogeneity of people. Instead, here the the mechanism exactly works on the, on the fact that there is this elasticity of beliefs. So if I switch from one to the other, uh, I switch from a more pessimist to more optimist, okay? So in substance, what is doing the central bank is buying stuff at the price of an optimist guy that doesn't have a chance to, to be the marginal because he can buy very little. So I intervene the central bank and say, okay, you guys are pessimists, give me your money, and I'm buying the price at which the optimist will, will, uh, will, they will decide. So in fact, I think it's as if I'm relaxing the constraint of the optimist. Okay, this is what the central bank is doing, is buying in, in, the, uh, in, in behalf of the optimist, at the price of the optimist. This is the, what, what it's doing, okay, essentially in, this, in these markets. Uh, so, what, what, imagine you are the pessimist, you want to buy it, what should I say? The thing is that if I make you more optimist, right, I make others more pessimist as well. So I'm reducing the heterogeneity. I mean, here I can lower rates because there is someone optimist that will say, no, no, I, I believe that Italy is never going to default but I cannot buy everything because, and so my belief doesn't reflect in the market. So the central bank comes, buy stuff, the, guy, the pessimists are the one that auto-select out of the market. Who remains is the optimist. So I'm buying at the price of the optimist and this reduce rates, okay? But what is important to understand is that if we don't understand this feedback from price, uh, from, from beliefs to price, okay? Uh, we will not have any effect. Even if the story makes sense, the maths tell us that we can torture the model, but without learning from prices, we will not get it. And learning from prices is a natural feature of financial market. Uh, some people ask me what, how the model will work without learning from prices. I'm not able to design a model in which you buy stuff, but you don't know the price. So I still, but you can do something. Uh, behavioral. Thanks a lot, Gaetano. So we move on and have uh, Louis tell us about exit from extended monetary accommodation. Thanks.
So thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, so this, <clears throat> this presentation is based on uh, ongoing work at the MF with a very long list of co-authors, um, who besides me include Marco Casiraghi, Kelly Eckhold, um, Gaston Gelot, uh, Daryl King, Marcin Colasa, Jesper Linde, and uh, Pavel Zabczyk. And I'll be doing a hybrid presentation where I'll, I'll do the presentation here and then Pavel will be mostly in charge with the Q&A session. He is right now in DC, so it's um, very early for him or very late, depending on the perspective. Um, but he's, he's online and following the presentation. So before I start uh, with the presentation, I think that, you know, I have to state the usual disclaimer that uh, these, the views expressed here are uh, those of the authors, including myself, uh, and they do not necessarily represent, represent the views of the IMF, of the IMF's uh, executive board, or, or of the IMF's management. And of course, all errors are our own. So, um, in terms of, um, of the structure of the presentation, you know, I'll start by providing some motivation. And then uh, I will present the, the conceptual framework that we have been developing. Uh, for this for this paper that allows us to uh, think about the, the trade-offs um, that central banks face when tightening monetary policy in terms of choosing which instrument they should prioritize to lead the tightening, that is, the policy rate or a reduction of their own balance sheets. And we're going to show some model simulations uh, really to uh, illustrate this, this key trade-off. And then uh, at the very end, um, I'll just go uh, give a, a short overview of some of the uh, key issues and, and very important issues um, that uh, temper this, um, the, the implications of the models and, and lead us to think about um, exceptions. And these include, uh, uh, of course, the role of the balance sheet and what would be the, the, the long-term size of the balance sheet and also issues of, of market functioning. So, um, sorry. so <clears throat> as, you, as we all know, between um, 2009 and 2015, uh, central banks in most advanced economies increased sharply the size of the balance sheets um, as they were uh, providing accommodation through quantitative easing. And after uh, 2020, you know, the balance sheet sizes uh, increased again uh, with the COVID crisis. But in between that period, in, uh, in 2017, um, the Federal Reserve uh, started uh, reducing its balance sheet. And, and before doing that, you know, they started uh, hiking the interest rate. So at the time, uh, there was a playbook that uh, uh, emerged that suggested that the policy rate hikes, um, which affect more the short end of the curve, as you all know, uh, should precede uh, quantitative tightening. And whereas quantitative tightening acts, of course, more on the long end of the curve and on on-term premiums. Uh, in the current setting where we have inflation rising and again monetary policy tightening, um, we think you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time to rethink this uh, pre-COVID playbook uh, to this environment of, of higher inflation. And so we'll try to answer uh, a few questions, um, namely how the central bank should uh, uh, should tighten, especially the ones that have a large balance sheet. And in particular, should they hike the interest rate first or reduce the balance sheet first? Or should they do something uh, at the same time where combine both interest rate hikes and balance sheet reductions? And of course, it would be even possible to think about situations there where they would hike rates and, and, and still increase uh, the balance sheet, you know, moving in, in opposite directions, where the policy rate tightening would be accompanied also by a balance sheet expansion. expansion. So of course, in the in the presentation, we treat the instruments mostly as substitutes, right? So you can you can do more of one or more of the other, but of course, we understand that often uh, they have very important complementarities. So the the accepted pre-COVID uh, playbook, as I said, and as implemented, namely by the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England before COVID. Um, prioritize these policy rate hikes, 
so once asset purchase is stabilized and uh, the investment of maturing assets stabilized the balance sheet, uh, the central banks were supposed to start uh, tightening monetary policy by raising interest rate rates, and then only uh, later they would start uh, reducing the balance sheet. And the main reasons for, for the playbook were um, frankly, that the transmission of uh, monetary policy through interest rates was better understood than through uh, asset purchases or asset sales. Uh, also, that postponing the reduction of the balance sheet was uh, seen as less likely to generate uh, market turbulence. Um, also, that interest rates uh, were interest rate changes were more were easier to communicate than uh, either QE or, or QT. And finally, and this is perhaps the, the, the core trade-off that we discuss here, uh, that raising interest rates um, first and before uh, shrinking uh, balance sheets would allow the central banks to gain policy space. That is, they would allow them to uh, cut rates uh, if, um, uh, if a downturn uh, occurred. Right? And so uh, basically here there was a, a view that having this conventional policy space available was important because central banks uh, assigned value uh, f uh, to being away from the effective lower bound or, or, the, or the zero lower bound. So you can think of this as of an, of an insurance argument uh, that we will review here uh, and then we, I'm going to illustrate that with some quantitative simulations. So we start with a simple uh, closed economy model. Uh, this is a very stylized, log linearized New Keynesian model uh, in, in line with or in the spirit of uh, uh, Woodford, 2003, and, but it has a few twists. And so the most important uh, twists include explicitly accounting for the zero, zero lower bound on interest rates and introducing uh, cognitive discounting as in uh, GABA 2020. And to keep the, the analysis tractable, uh, we avoid uh, formally modeling the financial intermediation channels, so it's a very stylized model, uh, although we do believe that they are very important for transmission. Um, and we really see um, that we wanna show the, the, the efficacy of large-scale asset pro uh, programs uh, really using the kind of pedagogical uh, model instead of a, of a more detailed one. So two of the three uh, components of the model are the IS curve uh, and the Phillips curve. So the IS curve here is expressed in terms of uh, output and the uh, real interest gap and allows for habit persistence through that parameter LF um, and uh, with sigma uh, determining the sensitivity of the output gap uh, to the real interest rate gap. So the equation um, includes insights from a standard New Keynesian uh, framework and also a segmented bond market uh, and, and shows that for a long-term uh, potential real interest rate, the real economic activity is affected by the whole path of the expected short-term real interest rates. And of course, these are driven by a combination of changes to policy rates and ch changes to term premium. Uh, for the Phillips curve here, the, the key parameter is delta, right, that uh, introduces the discounting of future outcomes. And this form of discounting dampens the, the impact of future events on economic outcomes today. Where, uh, where's the, the parameter kappa p there? Um, determines the sensitivity of inflation to the, out to the, to the output cap. And, and here, of course, we're also allowing for a cost push shock, and that's uh, epsilon uh, pi t. So as I said before, um, we assume that the, the actual long-term real interest rate, uh, here noted as uh, R long in the first equation, has two determinants, the, the policy rate uh, and the term premium. Uh, and the second equation uh, shows that the duration of the effective real rate is linked to that discounting parameter delta. And this uh, uh, helps uh, de decrease the, the effect of future policy rate shock. So basically addresses the, the, the forward um, guidance premium, uh, the forward guidance for the puzzle. So the, the, the composition is, uh, is, is really useful to, 
to capture these ingredients of conventional and unconventional arterial policy and transmission. So it, it, it shows that first, a reduction in policy rates will stimulate activity inflation by lowering the long run uh, uh, real interest rate. And it also shows that it, the entire uh, expected path of policy will, will of course have an effect on activity. But we also think that the, you know, the expectations of hypotheses of interest rates uh, does not necessarily uh, hold and does not fully characterize the behavior of these long-term real interest rates. And we follow Chang and others um, and assume that there is a non-zero long real term premium and that is driven by short term premium, by uh, an exogenous term premium shocks uh, and also depends negatively on the central bank's uh, balance sheet, right? And the sensitivity of this term premium to the, uh, to the asset purchase programs and the balance sheets is given by that, uh, by that uh, coefficient uh, new um, this one here. So, um, so in this case, the conventional monetary policy is assumed to follow a standard Taylor rule um, that is subject to an effective lower bound. And the calibration that we use here uh, tries to ensure that there is uh, a consistency of our results with the empirical estimates on the efficacy of these uh, asset purchase programs. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to show is that there's, uh, there's a trade-off between uh, having uh, greater hikes on the policy rate, given here on, on the y-axis, or greater sell-offs uh, of, uh, um, of assets by the central bank. And you can achieve any combination of tightening or any level of tightening, but using any combination of these two tools. Of course, the, you know, this is, this, these ISO lines are really for illustrative purposes because they can obviously be, be non-linear and not necessarily linear as, uh, as, as, as shown here. Right. So the, the simulation uh, from the model um, that I just introduced uh, uh, shows that a, a gradual and faster quantitative tightening doesn't really change the modal outlook for output and inflation. Uh, so this is basically to say that the trade-off, if you're looking at the modal outlook, the trade-off doesn't really matter. Right? You can achieve the same output gap and inflation outcomes with, with, the, with either instrument. Right? And so there's no reason a priori under the modal outlook to prioritize rate hikes or quantitative tightening. Uh, of course, uh, a faster quantitative tightening slows down the, the policy rate hikes and lowers the, the policy rate path. And so uh, you gain less conventional policy space. Right? So you don't move away from the effective lower bound as much as you, do, as you could do if you were to use less quantitative tightening. And of course, less conventional policy space can carry risks when you have uncertainty. And this is what uh, I'll discuss next. So the, this, this simulation here now um, really tries to show the benefit of a, of a risk management approach to monetary policy and tries to clarify this trade-off between policy rate hikes and quantitative tightening. Uh, and this is showing basically the situation that many uh, or several advanced economy central banks were facing back in 2015, 2017. Right. So in the simulation, the, this, the stylized economy is hit by some random mix of uh, demand and cost per shocks. Uh, so these are adverse, uh, uh, when you have adverse shocks, what would happen is that the recovery would basically stall and you have deflation and a negative output gap. And of course, the central bank would have to cut rates. Uh, so if you uh, adopt a gradual uh, uh, quantitative uh, tightening, which is given uh, by the two top charts, uh, the policy rates would, would have been allowed to, to, to rise more, and, and so they, be, they, could cut, they could be cut more uh, when the downturn occurs. Right? So this happens uh, um, on, on the, the, the second year. Um, so under this gradual quantitative tightening scenario, uh, you know, according to the simulation we did, you know, the probability of this economy hitting the zero lower bound 
in, it, in the first three years is about 18%, right? And so those shaded areas are basically showing uh, how likely it is that you're going to hit the, the, the zero lower bound. And you can see they're, they're, they're um, uh, somewhat tilted, they're somewhat symmetric for the first case. However, under aggressive quantitative tightening, right, the policy rate would have risen by less, right, because, because of that Taylor rule. And of course, the central bank uh, would, would find itself back on the zero lower bound with a much higher probability, right? So when you look at the dark shaded area in the bottom uh, charts, where you see that it overlaps with the x-axis uh, a lot more, right? And so we, we do a calculation in, the, in, in this simulation, and now the probability of hitting the zero lower bound is about 28%, so it's substantially higher, right? And of course, um, these episodes of hitting the zero lower bound, you know, of course, as well known, you know, they're, they're, they're costly. Um, um, uh, in terms of output and inflation outcomes. So bottom line is if you have a more gradual approach to QT when uncertainty or downside risks are important, um, you can have a more aggressive tightening uh, of the policy rate and then you gain policy space and of course if, if the downside risks materialize, you have more room to cut rates and avoid hitting the zero lower bound. So you can think that in this case, you know, having a large balance sheet is an insurance against downside risks to uh, output inflation. I have three minutes, okay. Very good. Now, very quickly, uh, of course, if you look at the simulation at the, in, the, in the current setting, right, now the case for uh, delaying quantitative tightening uh, is much smaller, right, because as the inflation outlook is much more positive, right, the risks of hitting the zero lower bounds uh, would be much, much smaller. And in fact, you know, the, the um, under aggressive quantitative tightening, the, the, the risks of hitting the zero lower, the zero lower bound are, um, are about 6%, whereas if you do uh, uh, gradual QT, it's, it's only 4%. It's 4%. So, and of course, the case for, uh, uh, for doing this, uh, um, this, this fast tightening is even greater if the central bank can use negative interest rates, right, because then the ELB is even uh, less constrained, constraining. All right. So, of course, uh, you know, there are a series of other issues. I'm going to speed up now because I've noticed that I don't have much time left. Uh, but there are a host of other issues to, to think about, like, you know, market resilience and functioning. Uh, of course, you know, past experience uh, shows that it's very important to manage these risks to, to market functioning and to have a, a very good uh, communication strategy. And this, of course, warrants a somewhat cautious, more cautious approach than uh, to quantitative tightening than what the model simulations are, 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 are telling us, right? Now, could spillovers, this, this is the second, uh, the second part of the presentation, and uh, I'll try to be very brief here. So could spillovers be different uh, when you do uh, QT versus, uh, um, versus policy tightening? Uh, now, the, the empirical evidence on the uh, effects, especially the spillovers of quantitative tightening, uh, is very, very scarce. Right? We do have evidence for quantitative easing, but there's no reason a priori to think that the effects will be symmetric. So for this reason, we, we do also a simulation. We set up another model. Right? And uh, so the model basically um, is based, is a two-country indication model, one minute, uh, by, uh, based on Kolas and Wesolowski. And it has segmented asset markets. Uh, Short-term and long-term bonds are imperfect substitutes. The costs affect the term premium, and they also depend on endogenous positions. And the central bank can affect premium dynamics by, by determining the bond supply. Right? And again, some of the other elements that we use for the other model are also present here. Uh, we calibrate the, the, the model to be consistent with the empirical evidence about the, the transmission of, of, of uh, um, of policy rate hikes and also of uh, um, changes in, 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 in asset holdings. Um, and let me go quickly to the results uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. So um, the, model, the, you know, the model what is, what is basically showing, right, is that um, uh, in quarter five, right, where you see here marked by that uh, vertical line, there's a mix of uh, shocks, right? And this ca cause output to expand and inflation to rise uh, above the 2% target. Can I just have two more minutes? Yeah, okay. And, uh, and so in the red dashed line, um, 
in the two top left panels, right, you can see uh, that the policy route, the, the policy route, will, uh, the policy rule will call for a liftoff from the effective lower bound within two quarters, um, and the uh, uh, bond holdings by the central bank will, will decrease very gradually, right? Now, in this, in, in this case, the foreign central bank uh, could improve on outcomes by uh, tightening monetary policy. And this is what the green dotted lines uh, are showing. Um, uh, and it would do that through a more rapid sell-off of, of its assets combined also with a less aggressive uh, policy path. And the blue dotted line there um, shows that the, the, uh, uh, compares the policy or this policy with another one where the central bank maintains a large balance sheet and tightens only with the interest rate. So both policies you know, really are calibrated to, to show the same effects on output cap and inflation. And we, as we could expect, the transmission to foreign long rates is much stronger under QT um, than under the interest rate uh, uh, tightening uh, uh, scenario. So the, the other two columns you know, show the spillovers to a small open advanced economy, uh, so that's the middle column, and to a small emerging market economy, that's the right column. So the advanced economy is calibrated in the same way as the large economy, uh, and the emerging market economy has different, a different financial structure that allows it for a larger pass-through uh, to, to inflation. Uh, uh, so when we compare the, the, across the two uh, columns, um, we see that both strategies lead to lower outputs, uh, but tightening with short-term policy rates is, is, uh, has a less adverse output effect compared to quantitative tightening, especially in EMEs. And the reason why this, uh, this is happening is because uh, the effect of QT on the exchange rate is larger, right? So, uh, so broadly, under the CM calibration, a weaker exchange rate will set off inflation and is going to push the central bank to tighten the policy rate more. And this, of course, will have uh, cause a further reduction in the EM output uh, and, the, and the quantitative tightening. So I think I'm going to, to finalize now. Um, so in terms of uh, conclusions, um, we try to show uh, an overview of some of the issues that are associated with the access for monetary accommodation. Because the main trade-off here is that the more gradual quantitative tightening allows for uh, more policy space to be gained. Um, we also show that uh, tightening the stance of monetary policy using the short-term interest rates has smaller exchange rate effects, and this, of course, will mean that we'll have smaller adverse outputs spillovers, especially to emerging markets. Uh, and we also show that there is a, a significant additional reason why quantitative tightening has less benign effects abroad, and this has to do with the greater transmission into the term premium and long rates more broadly, which really provides a larger drag on demand. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Luis, for telling us about uh, those important uh, topics that are certainly on the top of everyone in central banker's mind. We have like four minutes for questions. So thanks a lot for uh, interesting simulations and the, and the presentation. Uh, I was thinking about the current uh, situation uh, if you compare the US and the, and the euro area. So you know, very roughly speaking, in the euro area, we are experiencing a very huge uh, terms of trade shock. Okay, your model is, uh, if I understand, closed economy model. But you think about that as a cost push shock. Now, in the, in the US, it's more maybe a demand side story. So the economy is you know, very overheated. Uh, so could you comment on whether um, this difference in the sort of shocks that are hitting the economy could affect on, on, uh, on how gradual you want to be in terms of uh, reducing the balance sheet or, or hiking the rates? Thanks. Is Pavel online? Yes. I just, I just want to check with him if he wants to take this one or if he wants me to take it. Sorry, I, 
I don't know if you can hear me, but 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 just uh, go ahead. I mean, I I, I think uh, I mean, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll take this one. So I think you know it's useful to think perhaps in terms of the first simulation, right? You know this insurance aspect. Uh, so if you think that downside risks are more significant, right? Uh, then it would make sense to have a more aggressive tightening in the policy rate and less tightening in the um, in the in the on the balance sheet, right? And so if 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 you look at if you compare the you know what's happening now in the U.S. And in the euro area, where the, the the mix of shocks is different, and the the magnitude of downside risks to the economy are also different, right? This would pref probably mean that in you know, and this is my opinion, okay, that you know in the euro area, it, makes, it would make more sense to have a slower uh, winding down of the of the balance sheet, right, than compared to than compared to the U.S., right. Um, of course, you know you also have other issues to consider, to consider like market fragmentation. You know, so there's a host of other issues that would probably warrant a, a, a more cautious approach. I don't know if um, if if Pavel wants to add anything. So I think the only thing I would say, and that kind of goes a little bit to, to results you didn't have quite have time to, to show. I think in terms of the spillover, yes, of course, the, the exact balance uh, mixture of shocks will matter. But I, I think the mechanism we find and the different transmission in that QT works more through long-term rates, that, that, that seems robust to, to the exact underlying mixture of shocks. And so these conclusions and also the conclusions on the spillovers that, uh, that we find that conventional policy tends to have less adverse spillovers onto uh, kind of the, the neighboring economies or be, be they advanced or emerging, that, that I think would be, uh, that, that would hold and that would be a fairly robust result. Okay, so we have time for one last quick question by uh, Mikhail and a brief answer, please. So thank you for a very interesting presentation. So my question is really a clarification. So. Um, uh, uh, it, there seemed to be a great deal of substitutability between conventional policies and the quantitative policies in your model. So in that setting, what is really the cost of the zero lower bound? Yeah, I think our, our model in that sense is very pedagogical, right? So, so we're really trying to, um, to think that once you're away from the zero lower bound, they, they act as substitutes, right? But when you are at the zero lower bound, then you can think of them as, as not being substitutes because the, you know, you can no longer um, adjust the interest rate according to the Taylor rule, right? So the substitutability comes from that, right? That if you tighten more from, from the balance sheet, right, then the Taylor rule is telling you tighten less in the interest rate. And that breaks down once you hit the zero lower bound, right? If you only use what? So, Pavel, do you want to take that one? I, I didn't quite hear. I, I think the, the only thing I, I, I'd say is, uh, I mean, I, I heard the first part of the question, not, not the clarification. So I, I will say that uh, I, I think what Louis stresses is the importance of, uh, you know, the, I think at the zero lower bound, uh, you know, we, we, we need, um, oh, the, the con convention monetary policy stops working so well, and the model, you know, the, the, the tricks or the twists in the model were engineered to ensure that forward guidance doesn't buy you out of trouble. So in that sense, the, you know, the substitutability between the policies, and I think that that's worth remembering and perhaps uh, wasn't stressed enough, breaks down at the zero lower bound. And then that's where you really, the, the, the only game in town becomes, well, Forward guidance is weakened because of assumptions we make, and so then uh, quantitative easing is, is the only game in time, to town. And, and that's where the lin linearity that Louis showed you, uh, that's where uh, this would break down, essentially. Okay, thank you so much. We have another question by Nicolas in the chat. Pavel, if you have maybe a chance, it would be great if you could maybe directly comment on that in the chat. Thanks a lot uh, to both of you for, right. uh, for a great uh, talk and many insights now. We move on to the last paper in the first uh, session of today, where Leopold will tell us whether we should be feared uh, of hiking. Oops. 
Um, yeah, okay, so this is a joint work. Uh, this is working? Um, this is a joint, yeah, working. Uh, this is a joint work with, uh, with uh, Martin, who is in, uh, in St. Gallen. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, to, to the organizers for uh, putting us on, on the program. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, the discussions after the talk uh, that I'm, I'm sure uh, will follow. Um, so what's motivating us uh, are these uh, two, two uh, developments, which uh, I'm sure everybody in this room is, is uh, very much aware of, that uh, sovereign debt levels <clears throat> in the last uh, uh, 15 years, so since the, since the Great Recession, uh, have reached uh, uh, very high, uh, high um, levels. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, the key interest rate sets uh, by the ECB have been, been very low. So only very, only very recently, uh, we have exited uh, the, the zero lower bound after quite a, a long spell there. And uh, this had le has led to a, to a heated uh, discussion uh, within the, the Eurozone um, about uh, the, the monetary fiscal interaction that might be behind this, this pattern. There is this narrative, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, mainly coming out of Germany, but also other, uh, say, uh, Central and Northern European uh, economies, that actually the ECB is uh, keeping uh, the, the interest rate uh, low, uh, not, uh, not uh, motivated by its, its mandate of uh, maintaining stable prices, but actually uh, to protect uh, some, some highly indebted uh, governments uh, from, uh, from rising uh, borrowing costs. Uh, now, uh, our, uh, our uh, um, uh, contribution in this paper is to, to kind of, before we, uh, we complain, uh, let's try to, to understand uh, the, the problem a bit better. Um, and uh, we ask a specific research question, namely, uh, how does uh, monetary policy, and in particular the, the short-term rate uh, set by a central bank uh, uh, in a monetary union, affect uh, sovereign borrowing and the risk of a sovereign default of, of a member country in, in that, uh, in that uh, monetary union? So uh, this is not a paper about unconventional policies, uh, it's, a, it's a paper about uh, conventional monetary policy, uh, the, the interest rate set by, by the central bank. Uh, and to answer this question, uh, we want to see what does a de workhorse model of sovereign default, uh, of the sovereign default literature, the Eaton Gersowitz model, uh, have to say about this. Um, and uh, to that end, we, we adapt the, that model to the specific situation that, uh, that uh, we want to analyze. So we embed a, a small open uh, economy that's uh, borrowing uh, in terms of, of uh, defaultable debt inside a monetary union. Uh, that means uh, the, there is a central bank in that monetary union which is able to affect the outside option of the investors who are buying that, uh, that debt. And the second, second um, adjustment we make to, to, the, to the standard framework is we introduce a nominal rigidity in the form of, uh, of downward uh, rigid uh, wages uh, and this will uh, lead in equilibrium to the possibility of unemployment. If wages uh, do not uh, fall fast enough to clear the market, uh, unemployment can, can occur, which, is, uh, uh, or which, which reflects uh, the, uh, the outcomes we have seen in the Eurozone over the last, say, uh, 15 years. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, having a, uh, a nominal rigidity also uh, implies uh, that uh, monetary policy can have real effects on, on uh, demand and output in, in the model. And in modeling the, 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 the nominal friction through sticky wages, we're following a recent, uh, a, a recent uh, literature uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, quite influential uh, papers here. So uh, the main insight of our, our paper is that uh, the answer to the, to the question that, that we posed uh, in the beginning uh, is not obvious. Uh, and actually, it's highly, highly state dependent. Uh, and uh, in particular, the, the sign of the effect of an interest rate increase on uh, sovereign borrowing and the risk of a sovereign default uh, changes depending on the level of outstanding debt. So at low levels of debt to GDP, an increase uh, in, in uh, the interest rate set by the central bank leads uh, to uh, a reduction in debt levels and a reduction in, uh, in sovereign default risk, while at high debt levels, um, the debt level further increases in response 
to a, to a rate increase uh, and, uh, and that uh, raises then uh, the risk of a sovereign default. And this, uh, this region in, in the state space where debt to GDP is, is high, uh, we call the fear of hiking zone because it means that possibly in this region the central bank might be tempted not to raise rates maybe as aggressively as, as necessary to, to uh, say, uh, reach its, its, its uh, price stability uh, target. Now, uh, in a nutshell, what, what we do in the paper and which, what I'll also do in, in, uh, in the talk today is we focus on, on analytical intuition in, in characterizing uh, the, the emergence of this, this threshold level uh, for debt to GDP. Uh, and we'll show that it's, it's uh, driven by the competition basically between a substitution and an income effect. So the substitution effect is that if borrowing costs go up, that makes borrowing less attractive, uh, that induces uh, governments to run uh, higher primary surpluses uh, and reduce their borrowing. And in, in, uh, in, uh, over time, a reduction in, in borrowing then will lead to, to a reduction in sovereign default risk. Uh, the income effect is that uh, uh, a rise in, um, in interest rates for uh, a given path of primary surpluses means borrowing costs are higher and debt levels will rise. And uh, the important thing is that, or the important point is uh, that uh, the substitution effect is a marginal effect that's uh, equally strong independently of the level of debt that an economy has, while uh, the income effect works on the stock of debt. It becomes stronger the higher is the current debt level. And at some uh, threshold level of debt, this income effect is going to dominate the, the substitution effect and an interest rate increase will, will lead to more borrowing and a higher, higher default risk. Um, and then we also analyze uh, how these, how these uh, income and substitution effects uh, depend on, on structural features of the economy and, uh, and the state of the business cycle. And then since, uh, since uh, the answer to, to the question is not, not theoretically obvious, uh, we'll try to, to quantify uh, whether we should be worried about this fear of hiking in, in an application of the model uh, to, to Italy. And what we find is that, uh, yes, given the, the recent uh, observations of, of the Italian economy, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, Italy did spend a substantial amount of time inside the fear of hiking zone, but actually did not, uh, did, did not spend uh, all the time there. So there were also points where, where Italy would not have been in this zone and say an interest rate increase would not necessarily have led to, to a rise in sovereign default risk. And then if there's time at the end of the, the presentation, uh, I will talk about some policy implications of, of our framework. Uh, but I should stress that these are purely positive. So we, we, there is only positive analysis in this paper. We do not, we do, do not uh, take any stance on whether the ECB does or, or should take into account uh, the, the risk of sovereign default uh, in, its, in its policy stance. OK, so I'll, uh, I'll quickly sketch uh, the model to, to uh, give you an intuition for, for how our, our, our results arise. Uh, so it's uh, uh, an Eaton Gersowitz uh, style model. We have a small uh, open economy in, in a monetary union. Uh, small here means that, uh, that the government policies uh, do not have, uh, have any impact on, on the broader equilibrium in, in, in the union. The, uh, the economy consists of households, of firms, uh, and the domestic government, and uh, the economy is subject to a nominal friction in the firm of a form of downward wage rigidity, meaning a wages, nominal wages cannot fall below a, a, a specified level. And then uh, the, the government can, can borrow externally from foreign lenders, uh, which are located inside the monetary union as well, uh, they are they are risk neutral, and the rate at which uh, the, the, uh, at which these lenders are, are willing to lend to, to uh, the domestic government uh, can be set by, by a central bank. And for the purpose of, of this presentation, uh, I'll, I'll pick this, the simplest case of the model, where uh, all the time the nominal wage utility will be a binding constraint uh, on the economy. Therefore all relative prices will be fixed and there is no uh, inflation in equilibrium. Uh, okay, so uh, the domestic household uh, consumes a bundle of, of goods uh, consisting of goods produced in the domestic economy and in the rest of, of the monetary union. The 
uh, household has, has standard preferences with an elasticity of substitution of uh, one over sigma, and uh, the home bias is given by one minus gamma, meaning uh, households spend a share of one minus gamma of their income or of their consumption expenditure on domestic goods and a share of gamma on goods imported from the rest of the union. And as is standard in this Eaton Gershwitz literature, uh, in the baseline version of the model, we'll assume that these households have no access to financial markets. So the, the borrowing savings decision is uh, completely done uh, by, by the government, and these households consume uh, hand to mouth. We also have an extension where we do allow uh, some of these agents to, to, uh, to, to save as well. So given that households are hand to mouth consumers, uh, consumption is simply equal to their labor income minus whatever they pay in, term, in, in taxes to, to the government, where, where T here uh, are, are the taxes, uh, and taxes are in, in this model also equal to the primary surplus run by the government. So the government does not spend money on, 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 any, uh, on any government consumption. Uh, if it raises taxes, that, uh, that uh, is, uh, the, is the, the entire primary surplus. Um, okay, so uh, the, the firms are, are very, very uh, simple and, and stylized in the model. We have a competitive uh, production market. Firms have a, a linear technology, which means uh, they will make uh, no profits in equilibrium, and they face this uh, downward wage rigidity, meaning uh, the wage uh, cannot fall, uh, fall uh, below uh, a normalized value of, of one. And as, as I said before, we assume uh, throughout uh, this presentation that wage rigidity uh, will be binding. And that means, in fact, that domestic output will be determined uh, by demand. And demand comes from, from two sources. It comes from the domestic demand, which is uh, 1 minus uh, gamma times the, the domestic consumption expenditure plus an exogenously given demand, which comes from the rest of the monetary union, which we call X. And this X will be the main shock that we have in the model, so shifts in demand from, from, uh, from the rest of the union are essentially uh, determining the, the business cycle state of, of the economy. So, uh, yeah, the output Y is equal to, uh, to domestic, uh, domestic demand plus foreign demand here. Um, and then we have uh, the interesting agent in the model, uh, which is the domestic government. The domestic government chooses a path for, for the primary surplus or, or taxes, and it finance that's, finances this by, by issuing debt, and then it also chooses whether to repay its debt in any given period or to default. Um, we have this uh, standard uh, setup with, with uh, long-term debt, where uh, the parameter mu is, is the inverse of, of debt maturity, so a higher mu means a, a shorter debt maturity, um, where mu is, is the, the share of debt that's maturing in, in any given period. So this government budget constraint here on, uh, on the left-hand side has uh, the, the coupon payment that uh, the government is making in, in any given period, that's the maturing debt, uh, plus the interest rate component. Uh, and then on, on the right-hand side, uh, the, there are the sources of financing, so the government can finance this, this, this coupon payment through uh, either raising higher taxes or issuing new debt at a bond price of Q. Um, and then uh, if the government uh, chooses uh, to default, that's going to impose a, a utility cost on the economy. And it will also mean that the economy gets excluded from borrowing uh, for, a, for a, a, a stochastic number of periods here. All right. So uh, to close the model, uh, we need, uh, we need a, an equation which, which prices, prices the bond. And this is given by this bond pricing equation of the risk neutral uh, foreign lenders. So uh, the, the bond price will be given by the value of, of repayment in, in, of the bond in the future. So we have one minus the, the probability of, of default times uh, the repayment in the non-default state. And this is discounted uh, by, uh, by the nominal interest rate, which is set uh, by the central bank, where importantly here, uh, this nominal interest rate I uh, is, is um, chosen, uh, chosen by a central bank, and it, it's a policy instrument. And the main exercise that, uh, that we look at in the paper is uh, how does a, a transitory change 
uh, in this interest rate set by the central bank affect the, the sovereign's borrowing decision and then the risk of a sovereign default. Um, yeah, so to, to solve this model, uh, we, uh, we go uh, to, to solve the, the borrowing decision uh, of, the, the, um, of the sovereign in states uh, where, where they don't default, and it turns out uh, that this decision is uh, described by a relatively standard Euler equation, where the first line here is the marginal utility of issuing an extra unit of debt, and the second line is uh, the marginal uh, cost of repaying that, that debt uh, in the future. Uh, so the marginal utility of issuing an extra unit of debt is given by the marginal utility of consumption, uh, where the government also uh, understands that by issuing more debt, it creates extra demand. So this, uh, this uh, marginal utility, is, marginal utility is, is scaled up by, by one over gamma, um, because extra spending creates, creates more demand and gives more than, than one extra unit of, of consumption. Uh, and then uh, the government also uh, internalizes that by spending more, uh, it will raise uh, the default risk and will thereby lower uh, the, the bond price at which it, it can, can issue that. So this is disciplining government borrowing uh, to some extent. And now in this Euler equation, we make explicit the, the nominal interest rate. And it turns out it shows up in two places here. Uh, so first in red, uh, we have the nominal interest rate just multiplying uh, the, the cost of, of future repayment, meaning a higher interest rate makes borrowing less attractive. Uh, and this is the standard substitution effect. And then in blue, uh, there is also a direct effect of the interest rate on, uh, on uh, the, the level of consumption of, of the borrower. So a higher, higher interest rate means debt service costs go up, uh, borrowing becomes more expensive, so total lifetime income of a borrower goes, goes down. This means consumption uh, decreases, and that pushes up, uh, pushes up borrowing today. So a standard, standard income effect here. Um, and then to understand which of these two effects is, is stronger, we basically take a total derivative of, of this equation with respect to the interest rate, and uh, to, to the level of borrowing. And uh, we, we arrive at this, at this uh, proposition here um, that the, there exists a, a threshold, uh, this calligraphic T, which has the property that if current uh, debt to GDP, so B over Y, is larger than this threshold, then the partial derivative of the level of borrowing with respect to the interest rate is larger than zero. So an increase in the interest rate will mean the level of borrowing goes up. While uh, if debt to GDP is below this threshold, then the derivative is negative, and interest rate increase will lower, will lower borrowing. Now this threshold uh, depends on, on three, uh, three important model parameters, the uh, elasticity of substitution, the debt maturity, and the home bias of, of the economy. So a higher elasticity of substitution uh, means a, a lower sigma increases the threshold. That means the substitution effect becomes stronger if the elasticity of substitution is higher, it makes it less likely that the debt level actually exceeds this threshold. Then we have uh, mu, which is the inverse of the debt maturity. So uh, a lower debt maturity, a higher mu, reduces the threshold. And that is the case because for a, a given level of debt, a shorter debt maturity means that actually the government has to roll over a larger portion of its debt within a, within a given period, and that makes the income effect stronger because the, the um, interest rate increases on uh, the maturing part of the debt. And then uh, finally, there is also the, the home bias, uh, which uh, in a sense determines the, the government spending multiplier in this model. The larger is the home bias, uh, the, the more uh, costly it becomes to do austerity with, within the model because the higher home bias means uh, domestic demand uh, is a, a stronger determinant of domestic domestic incomes. So a, a larger home bias uh, also um, also shifts up the uh, shifts down the threshold 
uh, a lower home bias, so a higher gamma shifts up the threshold, makes it less likely that, that we are in the, in the fear of hiking zone. And then also this, this threshold level depends on, uh, on the state of the business cycle through the primary surplus. And uh, this is because a higher primary surplus means for a given of level of debt, the, the government is actually refinancing a smaller proportion of debt, which weakens the income effect and also raises the, the threshold level. And importantly in this model, um, the effect of uh, the interest rate on borrowing has the same sign as the effect of the interest rate on default risk, because higher, uh, the default risk is monotone in, in the level of that here. Okay, so we then uh, calibrate this model uh, to, to Italy and uh, arrive at, at uh, the following, following set of, of results. Uh, the, average level, the average level of the threshold is around uh, 50%, um, which might seem, seem low, but then uh, um, we have to remind you that th this is a model where actually domestic households do not save, all that is external, so the right, the right uh, number to compare these 50% to is actually the external government debt of Italy, and in that sense, uh, the, the average level of the threshold is quite close to, uh, to the average level that we have observed for, for Italy uh, in the last, uh, last uh, decade or so. Um, and then it turns out that uh, that the, the that Italy has spent uh, around or spends on average around 70% of the time within the zero fear of hiking zone, and uh, and uh, it is more likely to be in the fear of hiking zone uh, in in a recession. So the indicator uh, here of being in the fear of hiking zone is negatively correlated with the level of domestic output. Uh, so to, to visualize uh, this, this fear of hiking zone, we have here a, a plot of the, the state space of the model, uh, where, where on, the, on the horizontal axis we have, ex we have external demand, on the vertical axis we have the level of debt to GDP, and you can see that most of the state space in the model is either the, 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 the fear of hiking zone, which occurs at low levels of, of external demand and high levels of debt, or it's actually this, the, say, safe zone, where, uh, uh, where uh, the, the uh, central bank could raise the interest rate without uh, risking, an, risking an increase in, in default risk. And then at very high debt levels in, in, the, in the top uh, left corner of the picture, the, the government chooses to default outright, where, whereas at low debt levels and high external demand, the, the government chooses to create so much demand that there's actually uh, inflation in the, in the domestic economy. All right, how much time do I have? Uh, seven minutes. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's oh, actually, wait a second. Uh, oh, actually, one minute. <laughs> it includes okay. questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then I'll be very quick. <laughs> I'll be very quick with the policy implications. Mm. We look at how does, uh, how does uh, a long spell at the zero lower bound, so a long decrease in interest rate, affect the probability of, of the economy entering the fear of hiking zone and here the main, the main uh, message is that uh, lo low, lo long interest rates, low interest rates for a long time uh, encourage sovereign borrowing and make it much more likely that the economy is, is in this fear of hiking zone and that makes it difficult to exit, exit the zero lower bound after, after a long time. And then the second policy implication is that uh, the picture changes a bit if we allow for, for persistent um, changes in monetary policy, which you could call announcements about future monetary policy or forward guidance. Uh, and here we find that a persistently or announcing a persistent rise in the interest rate makes this problem a bit less severe because, uh, because it, it induces uh, governments to already start running primary surpluses today if they anticipate higher interest rates in the future. Uh, yeah, and that is, uh, that is all I think that I have. So uh, in this paper, we, we stress this, this, uh, this uh, strong state dependence of the interaction between interest rates uh, and, and sovereign default risk uh, within, within a monetary union. And then we, we proceed to, to quantify this uh, and, and develop some, some policy implications. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Leopold. <laughs> we have time for a few questions, and given that we are maybe in one of those sad Nordic countries and we have some Italians in the room, I would expect some... It's coming. I was thinking that uh, so in the last years uh, the periphery was uh, was led to conduct a, um, 
counter cyclical I mean the austerity plans so my question is about austerity plans it's not obvious that uh, they are so we saw recession or crisis time in which they were forced to generate uh, some surpluses and what your model has to say about uh, that I mean will be optimal to to impose austerity plans should I answer or do we do we collect if um, yes very, it was a very nice paper. Just a short question on this thing about the income and substitution effect. So uh, uh, probably it has, should have something to do with how persistent, I guess, the interest rate changes are for these interest effects. So like permanent transitory income shocks, maybe you could just explain exactly what you assumed there. So just a very quick question. Uh, on the multipliers, it seemed that that the government spending was always pretty effective. Was that the case? And could you change that so that it varies with the cycle a bit and, and comment on that? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, so maybe I'll answer the, the first and the, the last question uh, jointly because I think they are they're highly related. So in what I've shown you here, uh, if the wage utility is binding, the model has a very large fiscal multiplier. Uh, especially because all the households are hand to mouth. So if we say there are some some borrow so some saver households, then the, the multiplier comes comes down a little bit. Nevertheless, so this is not uh, not a, a, a welfare uh, analysis, and uh, and we should not gloss over the fact that the interest rate increase will in any case be painful for for Italy. So if you raise the interest rate and induce uh, a higher primary surplus that's going to, to hurt the Italian e economy uh, a lot here. Um, so this is a positive analysis, uh, whether ha what's the actual interaction between, between uh, default risk and, uh, and monetary policy. Um, but I mean, uh, austerity in a, in a situation where there's already high unemployment uh, will, be, will be very painful. Um, and then the, 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 the second question was about the, um, the persistence of the shock. So the, the analytical result that, that we have here, this is true for, for a, say, one period, whatever model period you assume, one period increase in the interest rate, which is completely transitory, and then you kind of go back to whatever it is the exogenous path of interest rates. Um, and, uh, and this last picture that I showed, um, that's kind of uh, hinting at what happens if, uh, if we have not a, a perfectly transitory uh, change in interest rates, but a, a more persistent one. And, and what happens here is that, uh, in a sense, uh, the, a persistent increase in the interest rate is like a future negative income effect for the borrower. And that means uh, the borrower, borrowers will start saving more today if they expect uh, interest rates to be higher in the future. And, and that kind of shifts the, the threshold uh, around. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. So this concludes uh, the morning session. We have a break until 11.15 and then have another exciting session. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, thank you for uh, for being back, and uh, we are now approaching our uh, last session. I mean, of this uh, very great conference, uh, we, we we think I mean a very diverse and uh, rich uh, program. And this session, uh, which is macro models for the future, so the idea is like let's try to see how you know traditional macro models can be uh, enriched and and changed, and think about new sort of directions. And so the first paper actually will be presented by Nigel McClang. Uh, from uh, the Bank of Finland, it's joined with Guido Ascari and uh, Sophocles uh, Mavroides, a coherence without rationality at the zero lower bound. And uh, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Okay. All right, well, uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, including the paper in the program. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Guido Ascari and uh, Sophocles. Um, and of course, the views expressed in this presentation are my views, uh, ideally also my co-authors' views, but not the views of the Bank of Finland or anyone affiliated with the Euro system. Okay. 
So this paper uh, addresses some of the technical challenges of modeling the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates. Uh, we know that the zero lower bound is a pervasive constraint. Uh, therefore, we should want to incorporate it into some of our models. Uh, but that said, we still don't know a lot about uh, various aspects of modeling the zero lower bound. Uh, in particular, there's known issues with the existence and uniqueness of equilibrium, particularly in stochastic models with a ZLB constraint. Uh, so, for example, Ascari and Marveritas, my co-authors, uh, recently showed that a standard New Keynesian model will not admit a minimal state variable or MSV solution if the variance of the shocks is too large. And otherwise, it will admit uh, multiple MSV solutions, and so you need to think about equilibrium selection. And uh, at the core of this issue is this uh, intense destabilizing expectational feedback that is implied by rational expectations uh, when monetary policy is passive, uh, when interest rates are pegged at zero. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, if you take a standard New Keynesian model and you slap it together with a Taylor rule for the interest rate, and you hit that model with a really big persistent demand shock, the zero lower bound's gonna bind. Uh, but rational agents uh, correctly incorporate the persistence of a, of a big persistent shock like this uh, into their forecasts. And as I'll illustrate here, this implies this uh, very intense feedback between expected future income and current income while monetary is policy is passive while the zero lower bound binds. And uh, this implies the sort of strong income effect that can lead to uh, high inflation, uh, positive nominal interest rate. So we don't have a solution here. I assume positive nominal interest rates, that puts me at zero. I peg interest rates at zero, that implies positive nominal interest rates. Uh, so to the extent that rational expectations uh, implies this sort of destabilizing feedback that maybe makes it challenging to get equilibrium, uh, are rational agents too smart for their own good? Uh, what are equilibrium properties away from uh, full information RE? Uh, can a model that maybe doesn't have a rational solution admit some kind of non-rational equilibrium that might be uh, useful for our understanding of a low interest rate environment? Uh, so to address these uh, questions here, we derived uh, existence and uniqueness results uh, in a stochastic model with an occasionally binding constraint uh, away from full information RE. And uh, we argue that departures from rationality that kind of dampen expectations mitigate these concerns. And uh, I'll focus on two types of deviations. There's deviations that directly introduce discounting of expectations into the model. Uh, and then I'll point out that adaptive learning uh, maybe uh, under some assumptions can lead to this sort of, um, this sort of dampening as well. Okay, so uh, let me be specific. I'll, I'll share the model here that we use in the paper. It's just a simple New Keynesian model. X is the output gap, pi is inflation, I is the nominal interest rate, follows a, an active Taylor rule. Uh, we had a shock in the model here, epsilon t. It's a demand shock in the IS equation. And uh, we assume that it follows a persistent two-state Markov process. Uh, that's very standard assumption in this uh, uh, this part of the literature about equilibrium existence and uniqueness. So epsilon t can assume a high value, epsilon h, it can assume a low value, and we're gonna focus obviously on the low value, the low demand state. Uh, that's possibly what brings the uh, economy into a zero lower bound regime. And then the last bit of notation here is uh, the transition probabilities p, that's the persistence of the low state. So if I increase p, I'm making the, the bad state of affairs last longer. Q is the persistence of the high state. So uh, I'll stick with uh, this model in the talk. That's what we do in the paper. Uh, but for some intuition here, uh, let me make a, a useful simplification. Follow uh, Egertsen and Woodford, what they do. We assume that uh, the high demand state's an absorbing state. So Q is equal to one. And uh, furthermore, the, the shock disappears in that state. So the economy can return to a, a steady state after this transitory low demand uh, phenomenon ends. Okay, so in this world here, we, we, we begin in this low demand state. Maybe that puts us in a liquidity trap. Eventually it goes away and uh, we just return to a steady state. 
And if I uh, furthermore assume that we go back to the intended steady state of the model where inflation is on target, you know, where the monetary policymaker wants us to be, then I get this equation at the top of the slide uh, that describes uh, output in the low, low demand state here. And uh, what I want to point out is that coefficient nu of p, uh, which is the, the coefficient unexpected output there, it's a measure of the, the sensitivity of expectations or excuse me, the sensitivity of uh, output in the low state to expectations. Uh, this coefficient's a large coefficient, it's, it's greater than one, and th that tells us that, that demand is very sensitive to changes in expected future income when the zero lower bound is binding. Uh, and that new of P term is increasing in the persistence of the shock. So in this rational expectations world, the persistence of the shock is largely determining that feedback. Okay, so I'll, I'll touch more on that in a minute here. Uh, in this simple environment, a large demand shock is going to cause the zero lower bound to bind. That gives us the sort of standard MSV solution for output at the bottom of the slide. And if you look at this solution for long enough, you'll see that this P nu of P term, it, it plays a pretty important role. So P nu of P is specifically a measure of the, the strength of the feedback between agents' beliefs about what happens in this low demand state and the actual outcome in the low demand state, okay? And it's uh, strictly increasing here in P. So if this uh, expectations feedback is strong, if P nu of P is greater than one here, then a, a really negative demand shock is actually gonna imply high output, high inflation, uh, high nominal interest rate. And uh, this is the issue that I was alluding to in the introductory slide. Uh, I assume that we have positive interest rates, I end up at the ZLB. When I'm at the ZLB, that can imply positive interest rates. So to get a rational solution here, we have to restrict the support of the shock. So you either have to kind of kill this expectation feedback by restricting the true persistence of the shock P, or I need to restrict the, uh, the magnitude of that shock, epsilon L. And uh, we can visualize this restriction. So here I have, uh, let's see if I can get the pointer to work. Uh, low inflation, low state inflation on the vertical axis, uh, low state output on the uh, horizontal axis. The blue line is the Phillips curve. Uh, the red line is aggregate demand, and I've drawn multiple aggregate demand curves here. Basically, as you increase the magnitude of that shock, shifts the demand curve left. Okay, the kink is obviously created by the zero lower bound. When we're below that kink, uh, the ZLB is binding. And I just wanna point out that when we have this really strong expectations feedback, that means that aggregate demand is gonna be very flat relative to aggregate supply. Okay, this implies that demand and output is very sensitive to changes in inflation. That's a reflection of that feedback. But when we have this, uh, this uh, very flat aggregate demand curve, it's apparent from the picture that you need to restrict the, the magnitude of the shock to, to get an inter intersection of the curves there in equilibrium. And maybe you don't wanna make that restriction. If you don't, then you have to dampen that expectations feedback, and the only way to do that in the rational world is by restricting the persistence of the shock itself, generate the steeper uh, aggregate demand curve there. Okay, the cost of doing this, of course, is that we have an equilibrium that maybe won't feature a very persistent zero lower bound event. And we've observed very persistent zero lower bound events in Japan and arguably in the Euro area and the US as well, okay? So in this simple example, you need to restrict the support of the shocks to get uh, a rational solution or at least the standard kind of rational expectations equilibrium that we focus on. Let me make a, a couple of general comments though. Uh, so for general assumptions about the transition probabilities, uh, epsilon H and so on and so forth, we need to restrict the magnitude of the negative shock. Okay, so to get an MSV solution, epsilon L can't be too negative, it needs to be above a threshold. That threshold is increasing in the persistence of the shock uh, P, so we have to get, you know, make tighter and tighter restrictions as we, we increase the uh, duration of these, these bad zero lower bound events. Of course, the, the MSV solution is only one solution of interest. It's the primary solution concept used in the macro DSGE literature. Uh, other papers uh, have derived sunspot equilibria that can feature these very persistent liquidity trap events. Uh, those papers basically study a special case of the model that I have here. The demand shocks are shut down 
And as it turns out, you actually need to impose the same restrictions on the support of the demand shock to get those solutions. So if you don't restrict the demand shocks here, you don't get the MSV solutions, you don't get the sunspot solutions that have been studied in the literature. These are the two solution concepts that have, have been explored here. Could there be other equilibria? Uh, maybe we don't have necessary conditions for the existence of irrational expectations equilibrium. Uh, our numerical evidence suggests that this demand restriction here that is in the proposition is, is necessary for the existence of other solutions. This is an open question though. Could there be other solutions? Would they be interesting? Would they be plausible? Could they emerge through an adaptive learning process like the MSV solution could, which is something I'll talk about later. Uh, these issues notwithstanding, uh, this sort of rational expectations feedback makes it challenging to derive an equilibrium of a model with an occasionally binding constraint. So what if we just try to kill that feedback? What if uh, I replace the, the rational expectation with some uh, non-rational expectation? Sorry. Oops. Stop trying to use the pointer here. Um, some non-rational expectation E hat, which is proportional to the uh, rational expectation, where M is a, a constant that's less than one there, little m. Okay, if I, if I stick these non-rational expectations into the model, I hit it with a big shock, the zero lower bound is gonna bind. That gives me the solution at the bottom here of the slide. What you can see from this solution is that uh, a small enough value of that, that discount parameter, little m, uh, will uh, ensure a solution given any assumption about the persistence and variance of the shocks here. Okay, so dampening expectations uh, can, can mitigate this sort of uh, uh, equilibrium existence concern. And so what I want to point out now is that there's, you know, available uh, deviations from RE in the literature that deliver this sort of dampening. And I'll start with the obvious one. Uh, there are deviations from RE that directly introduce this sort of discounting of expectations into the model equilibrium conditions. So a number of papers have provided some micro foundations for those uh, discount parameters that I have there uh, in, in red. So think about Quebec's behavioral New Keynesian model uh, Woodford's finite planning horizons, uh, Angeletto's imperfect common knowledge. Uh, you know, these papers look at a, a lot of zero lower bound issues, uh, New Keynesian paradoxes, forward guidance puzzle, so on and so forth. Um, we contribute to that literature by establishing formally that this sort of discounting can ensure the existence of a, of a non-rational equilibrium, given any assumption about the persistence variance of the shocks. Okay. You just need enough discounting, and that's the inequality at the bottom of the slide there. Of course, these, uh, these deviations from rational expectations generally assume that agents know quite a lot about the structure of the economy. They know a lot about the model they live in. Uh, real life economists uh, have limited knowledge about the structure of the economy. And so, in contrast, the adaptive learning perspective is that agents have imperfect structural knowledge, but they learn to forecast uh, adaptively. Uh, for example, by using this sort of recursive scheme that I have here at the top of the slide, it says that the forecasts E hat evolve recursively as new data becomes available there. Okay, so what if I embed this sort of expectations formation scheme into the, the simple model that we're looking at here? Um, well, if you do that, it's, a, it's apparent that these beliefs are misspecified. In other words, agents can't learn a rational solution. They can't learn to forecast uh, the model dynamics correctly. Okay. Uh, but maybe this would be a, a reasonable way for the agents to, to forecast if they have this imperfect structural knowledge, um, if they maybe don't observe the shock, they don't know how to account for the nonlinearity implied by the zero lower bound. This is a simple linear forecasting rule. Um, or maybe it's because no MSV solution exists. And one thing that we argue in the paper that I won't talk about today is that if there is no MSV solution, because I haven't restricted the shocks appropriately, it's extremely challenging for learning agents to uh, learn how to correctly forecast the model dynamics using simple econometric tools. And so we would need to look for some sort of forecasting model, uh, alternative forecasting model. Uh, in any case, uh, if, if the agents can't, uh, if the agents do forecast this way, they're, they're not gonna learn how to forecast the model dynamics correctly, but they could learn the unconditional means of inflation and output. 
so they could learn to forecast correctly on average over time. Okay? And uh, that kind of begs the question, you know, if agents form their expectations this way, will their beliefs about average inflation and output converge to self-confirming values? So will this, this learning equilibrium with this sort of adaptive expectation scheme converge to a sort of restricted perceptions equilibrium, or RPE, in which the agents have self-confirming views about the thing that they're trying to forecast, which is the long-run levels of inflation and output here. And our model does admit an RPE. You need to put some restrictions on the support of the shock. That's the first point of the proposition. Uh, the second point, which is more important, though, is that the, the RPE condition, uh, the RPE existence condition is weaker than the MSV existence condition, uh, provided that the shocks are persistent. And they will be for plausible calibrations. So this weaker existence condition, it, it really just boils down to the fact that you have this weaker expectational feedback in the RPE. So in the MSV solution, as I illustrated or attempted to illustrate in that example, the feedback between expectations uh, from expectations is largely determined by the true persistence of the shock, P. In the RPE world, the forecasts equal the unconditional mean of inflation and output, which is a weighted average of what happens in the, the good state and the bad state. The weight on the low state is given by the unconditional probability of being in that low state, P bar. And that unconditional probability is, is therefore implicitly determining the strength of this sort of expectations feedback in the RPE world. And P bar is going to be less than the transition probability, provided that the shocks are persistent. Okay. And so this lax uh, existence condition makes it relatively easy for us to derive very persistent zero lower bound events in an RPE. So in a calibrated model here, we can generate uh, uh, you know, an RPE that features uh, recurring zero lower bound events that are expected to last for more than a decade on average. In the MSV world, the zero lower bound events can only last for maybe one, one and a half years on average. So departing from RE uh, uh, alleviates some of these concerns about uh, existence. Uh, just quickly, I'll note that uh, it also helps with equilibrium selection. We know from uh, my co-authors earlier work that the model that we're looking at here has multiple MSV solutions. If there is an MSV solution, we established that only one of those solutions has the property of being E-stable. Uh, E-stability is a condition that is used to predict when an equilibrium could emerge through an econometric learning process. So E-stability is a useful uh, selection criterion here. I want to note that the sunspot solutions that have also been studied in the literature, the alternative solution concept here, are not very plausible from a learning perspective. They're not E-stable. If agents try to learn them, we should worry about uh, deflationary spirals, and that's particularly true if the zero lower bound is recurring. So Mertens and Robin look at a, a sunspot equilibrium where there's a one-time liquidity trap event, and they show that maybe in that environment we, we don't worry about these unstable learning dynamics. The shock's recurring, we should definitely worry about them. There's a unique e-stable RPE, though, so only one RPE could emerge through this sort of econometric learning process. And in the discounting world, we have a, a unique solution. Okay, so the kind of last point I want to make before concluding is that, you know, our paper uh, supports the view that the RPE is a uh, plausible explanation for how we end up in a highly persistent liquidity trap event. Uh, we have a learnable RPE in this simple standard framework. The sunspot equilibria maybe aren't so plausible from the learning perspective, they're not e-stable. I also need to put tighter restrictions on the model to generate these equilibria. The MSV solution can't produce persistent liquidity trap events, and so they're not going to be useful uh, for this end. All right, so I'll, I'll conclude now uh, since I'm uh, running out of time here. So I've tried to emphasize here this sort of technical challenge. It's, it's hard to derive rational expectations equilibrium in full information RE frameworks with a zero lower bound constraint. This is due to this, uh, at least partly due to this sort of strong rational expectations feedback. If you can dampen that, uh, that sort of expectational feedback, then you can have uh, coherence without rationality. You can have a model that emits a non-rational equilibrium, but not any of the standard rational equilibria uh, that are, are commonly studied in the literature. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there, thanks. Great, so thank you very much, uh, Nigel, for the great, uh, for the great presentation. Uh, so let's see it open up for, for questions, if uh, uh, anybody has questions in the audience.
Let me remind also those online that they can write questions in the chat if they, if they want. Uh, Gaetano, please. So I was thinking um, that if we embrace the adaptive learning view or a backward looking view of uh, how people form expectation, we will have a hard time to rationalize forward guidance impact. So did you think about this? There is any way we can just uh, take both on board? Yes, please. They're like, yeah, so it's a, you have a very strong theory type of motivation for what you're doing, and that's fine. But is there like an empirical part to this? That sort of, uh, what's the type of empirical questions that you can answer with this that other? You talked a little bit about this with endogenous persistence. I guess that's it. So is there, have you tried sort of disciplining this with some survey evidence? There's like, if, Pretty big number of papers trying to discipline expectation formations with survey data. So it'd be nice to nice to see that together with your your tools. So. Any other questions? So if we can add a very last one, and then uh, uh, we collect everything. So, so recently, for instance, in the literature, uh, so what has been shown in other contexts, both like in uh, lab experiments, the micro found uh, some of these expectations, or in financial markets data is that the uh, forms of expectations like diagnostic or extrapolative expectations seem to be very realistic. Uh, and now, extrapolative expectations, I mean, both of those wouldn't necessarily always give you like this uh, a feature of like uh, uh, basically allowing uniqueness, I guess, in this case, because they don't fully discount in, in any single situation. So I don't know if you guys have thought about potentially how to use that form and maybe adjust it. Uh, or adding some restrictions in a way that could uh, potentially also give you the same uh, the same results. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the questions. I guess I'll take them in order here. Um, so yeah, Gaetano. Uh, yeah, we're 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 only providing a very limited role for forward guidance if we're uh, assuming that the expectations are formed in that way. Um, you know, I, I will point out that the paper that I have here on this slide, Giuseppe Gibbs and Preston, does look at uh, the optimal forward guidance policy under the assumption that um, agents are estimating the long run inflation and output rates in, in much of the same way with a sort of constant gain learning scheme. And, uh, you know, they come to the conclusion that it is optimal for, for the central bank to be very aggressive with that forward guidance policy so that agents can learn some of the potential implications of, of that policy. Uh, adaptively as soon as possible, um, but of course, you know, in that sort of framework, they're never truly learning the implications of that policy. They're just, you know, learning from the the expansionary um, uh, kind of consequences of it. So one thing that we could do is, you know, we could add, uh, we could modify the framework so that maybe there is some uh, third regime here that could be a forward guidance regime, kind of similar to what Bildi does. And, and try to build that into uh, the the agents, uh, uh, you know, forecasting um, to see see if that would have uh, uh, any effect on equilibrium existence. You know, kind of related to this question um, about the the empirical implications of this. You know, yes, this is certainly a theory paper. Uh, it's, it's very much focused on on this existence uh, issue. Um, you know, the obvious thing that comes to mind to me is just uh, investigating the empirical plausibility of these different equilibria that we're promoting. So, I mean, the point here is that you deviate from RE, you can get a non-rational equilibrium in a model that doesn't have the rational one, but I'm giving you multiple types of equilibria that could have different properties. You know, the bounded rationality discounted expectations equilibria would certainly have, uh, you know, different properties than the RPE. And so, uh, you know, finding a way to to, to maybe investigate the plausibility of that, you know, for instance, by disciplining the expectations using survey data is something that we're interested in, in thinking about more. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the last point there, uh, it, it is important to note that deviations from RE that amplify the expectations feedback are possibly going to lead to the exact opposite result. And so that's, that's one thing that we want to, uh, you know, think about carefully. Uh, the only thing that we really, you know, claim to know from this paper is that if you can dampen the expectations feedback, you get the weaker existence for a lot. So, uh, yeah, thanks so for I the think questions. Actually, there's also another question by Seppo, oh, I okay. think. Yeah, please. This is more of a comment, to, actually, to the first question to Gaetano, which is, you can build a model 
where you for which is the model for given say interested expectations, and then you just say the simplest assumption would be then that the forward guidance is fully credible, so the agents just incorporate that interest rate path, expected interest rate path to the to the solution concept. So that that is straightforward to do, and I've, we've actually I've done it in in some models. Just a quick response to Seppo's comment there. Uh, yes, no, I'm, I am fully aware of that. We're just using an Euler equation framework here. So yeah, if we if we looked at the full infinite horizon decision rules, I mean, obviously that what you're describing has been done in a lot of papers, and so that would be a something I should have added to my uh, response to Gaetano there. Oh, please, Andre, yes. Do we have the issues with existence and uniqueness for any interest rate path after exiting? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can only say that we have this existence uniqueness problem if, uh, if the policymaker is following a Taylor type rule or is implementing something like the discretionary policy, that's what Ascari and Mavaridis uh, suggest. But if I, if I wanted to modify the framework to, to model monetary policy or any other aspect of policy differently, that could lead to very different existence and uniqueness results. So here we're just restricting attention to this, this Taylor rule set up and, and examining how expectations affects the issue. Great, so if there's no other questions, then we're actually right on time. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nigel, again, for the, great, uh, for the great talk. Thanks for the questions. And everybody for the questions. And then we can move on to the second paper, which will be presented by Oliver Feuti uh, from the University of Mannheim. And it's a behavioral Hank model, a behavioral heterogeneous agent, New Keynesian uh, model. Uh, and the paper is co-authored with Fabian uh, Zeirich. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So yeah, I'm, my name is Oliver Feuti. I'm a PhD student at the University of Mannheim. And this joint work with Fabian, uh, who's also a PhD student, but in Berlin. And as uh, Francesco said, the title is Behavioral Heterogeneous Age New Keynesian Model. And we're actually going to explore how heterogeneity might matter in the context of cognitive discounting. And the paper's really motivated kind of by some recent empirical findings about the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy. So there's more and more evidence that monetary policy affects household consumption to a large extent through changing people's incomes, so through indirect general equilibrium effects, and maybe less directly through changes in the interest rate. And it turns out that these indirect effects empirically are such that they tend to amplify or increase the effectiveness of conventional monetary policies. Announcements of future monetary policy actions or forward guidance, on the other hand, seem to have relatively weak effects in stimulating current economic activity. And related to the, to the uh, previous presentation, we have seen many advanced economies have been stuck for quite some time at the zero lower bound, but we did not see any large instabilities arise because of that. And the last fact I want to mention is kind of related to the first one and simply says that the micro moments matter for the transmission of monetary policy. In particular, it has been shown what, what really matters for the effectiveness of monetary policy is that households that have higher marginal propensities to consume tend to be more exposed to aggregate income fluctuations, in particular when they're driven by monetary policy. So in that paper, we provide a heterogeneous housing model that can account for all these facts simultaneously. And it turns out that by doing that, we actually resolve a tension that exists in, in Hank models, as has been shown by Verning or also will be, that there's kind of this tension between kind of the, the underlying micro transmission of, of monetary policy facts one and four, but then also these stability issues and forward guidance facts two and three. And the way we approach this, as you might have guessed from the title already, is we kind of keep the new Keynesian structure, but we allow for household heterogeneity in complete markets and bounded rationality in the form of cognitive discounting, leading to what we call the behavioral Hank model. And we approach this in a kind of twofold way. First, we rely on a limited heterogeneity setup where we restrict our attention to a very simple framework, which is two types of households, and that gives us a lot of attractability. We can show everything in closed form and gives us an understanding of what is driving these results and, and where is this tension coming from. Uh, but we then move to kind of also a full hang setup to show that the results do not depend on these uh, really strong assumptions we need for the analytical results. And we can then also dig a bit deeper in kind of the 
heterogeneity in the behavioral bias and leading to some interesting interactions. And then also kind of the question that comes up is, does that even matter? So we will look at policy implications. And I fear that I might not have a lot of time in the end. So let me give you a preview of what we find in terms of policy implications. We look at kind of the recent episode of supply-driven inflationary pressures, in particular negative TFP shock, but we also discuss cost push shocks, for example, in the paper. And we find that if monetary policy wants to stabilize inflation in that environment, it has to act very forcefully in the behavioral model, much stronger than in the rational model. And the reason really is, is that the rational Hank model suffers from the forward guidance puzzle. So if you increase interest rates, and households expect that interest rates will stay elevated, in the rational model, this is extremely powerful in bringing inflation down. This is kind of a contractionary forward guidance. But this is not the case in the behavioral model. These expected interest rate increases are much less powerful. So you have to act more strongly already today. And as this kind of line of reasoning applies in every period, you also have to act more persistently. However, by doing that, you kind of create side effects. First of all, we find that there's a strong increase in consumption inequality because these higher interest rates will redistribute to wealthy households. And we also find a strong increase in government debt, especially in kind of a post-COVID world where the initial debt levels are already high. These effects are, are much stronger, actually. And what we then also see, and this is kind of where the heterogeneity really plays a role, is that how you then repay that debt matters much more in the behavioral model because of, because of the behavioral friction, you need a stronger response, and therefore you have, have stronger spillover effects. And then how you repay that debt um, will differ quite substantially across the two models. And in particular, we find that having a very progressive tax system where only the rich households pay in the behavioral model is relatively much more effective in bringing inequality down compared to the rational model where the, uh, the differences across the fiscal or tax systems are, are, are very small, actually. So overall, we, we find a very strong trade-off, much stronger than in the rational model, between kind of price stability and these spillover effects, in particular fiscal sustainability or the fiscal footprint of monetary policy and inequality. All right, so this is kind of the overview. I will go rather quickly over the tractable model. Um, so yeah, I, I already said that we have these kind of three building blocks, uh, New Keynesian side with sticky prices, heterogeneous households, and cognitive discounting. And the goal of that setup is to keep everything tractable, but also keep the model interesting. So we will have heterogeneity in, in households' income exposures to aggregate income fluctuations, heterogeneity in MPCs, a precautionary savings motive, which is kind of interesting because we will see how precautionary savings motives um, will interact kind of with the, with the cognitive discounting that we have. All right, so to be a bit more specific, we have two types of households. One is what we call an unconstrained household. This is kind of the standard intertemporally optimizing household and the hand-to-mouth household. And we have a, a fixed share lambda of these hand-to-mouth households. Later on, this will be endogenous, and the share will be time varying. But for now, this is all exogenous. And they differ in their income components and access to financial markets, as you will see on the next slide. So only the unconstrained households actually save in bonds and, and by the shares of the firms and the hand-to-mouth households simply consume whatever income they have. And this will give us the, these heterogeneity in MPCs and in income exposures. And we allow for an idiosyncratic risk so that each individual household faces a risk of becoming hand-to-mouth from one period to the next. So each hand-to-mouth household might become unconstrained. So this really gives us these precautionary savings motives um, kind of in a, in a sense, what we will have later on in the, in the full-blown model. And then the, the strong assumptions we need is we need assume full insurance with it type. So there's really kind of two representative agents, if you want. And we focus uh, on the zero liquidity equilibrium. Later on, we're going to relax uh, these assumptions. All right, so the, the households have standard utility. The unconstrained households, they have this type switching probability 1 minus s. So a probability one minus s from one period to the next, an individual household might become hand to mouth. And their budget constraint is quite standard. They can consume, they can save in bonds, and they buy the shares of the firms, which is this Yoda T plus one, is the shares that they buy at price new. They receive labor income, they receive dividend income after taxes, which is this D tilde, and then they receive the interest income on the previously acquired bonds, but only of a fraction s, because only the unconstrained households save, so only those bonds that 
were acquired by unconstrained households that are still unconstrained now are actually going to the, to the unconstrained households. The hand-to-mouth households, on the other hand, as I said, they do not save, but they, um, so they receive um, some of the interest rate income on bonds from the households that were unconstrained and are now hand-to-mouth, which is this one minus S uh, BUT term, and they potentially receive some transfers or pay taxes uh, to the government. All right, so and we, the, just to, to, so they do not participate in financial markets, so these will be kind of the households that we think of as being the high MPC households. So they just spend, after adjusting their labor supply, just spend every uh, uh, income they have. All right, so the rest of the, the, the model is super standard. We have firms in a in standard New Keynesian way. The government for now is quite boring. The only thing they do is they potentially uh, tax the profits at rate tau d and redistribute to hand to mouth households. The only reason we have this is this allows us to kind of relegate, uh, regulate the, the income exposure of the different households, as you will see on the next slide, because um, after a monetary policy shock, wages and profits will go in different directions. So by redistributing profits, um, we actually can, can play around with, with how exposed they are. Monetary policy for now, simple Taylor rule and monetary policy shocks, which is the only source of aggregate risk in that model for now. All right, so then there are two key equations that come out. The first one is the consumption of the hand-to-mouth households. And you see we can actually, in the equilibrium, write the, the consumption of the hand-to-mouth households as a linear function of aggregate income or total income, y hat. And this chi parameter tells you how exposed the high MPC households are to aggregate income fluctuations. And in line with what I call fact four on the first slide is the data tells us that chi should be larger than one. High MPC households tend to be more exposed to aggregate income fluctuations, especially when they're driven by monetary policy. And here you see where this tau d comes in. Um, by, by changing tau d, if we, if we would take a, basically all the profits and give to the hand to mouth, chi will become smaller than one. And some papers have done that. that yeah, I will show you what, what the, the uh, implications of that are. But in, 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 because we want to match this four fact, we will actually assume that chi is larger than one, which would also hold if we simply forget about these taxes and set tau d to zero. The second key equation is the Euler equation of, of the unconstrained households. And now this is quite standard except for two things. The first is this type switching probability, the precautionary savings motive, where with probability one minus S, an unconstrained household becomes hand to mouth. And then what matters for her decision is the consumption of the hand to mouth households groups. But then we have these cognitive discounting, and these, these bounded rationality expectations in there. Um, uh, um, to, and we will see now how this will, this will matter. But first, let me quickly uh, tell you how we model uh, bounded rationality. And we follow GABEX and model this as cognitive discounting. So the idea is simply you have to form an expectation about some variable x t plus 1. And what you can do is you can kind of split, off, uh, split up this variable in a, in, a, in a default value, which we call x t, and the deviation from it. This always holds by definition of the deviation. And now the behavioral assumption is that you're kind of rational or you anchor your expectations to that default, but you cognitively discount the expected deviation from it, which is the second, the last term we have the rational expectations operator, but you cognitively discount according to this parameter m bar. If we set m bar to one, we're back to rational expectations, but we actually go to the data and we find quite some evidence that households tend to underreact in particular to macro news and we find values of something like 0.6 to 0.85, and we take 0.85 as kind of our benchmark value, which is kind of a, a small deviation from rational expectations, if you want. And this is also the benchmark case that Gabex uh, uses in his representative agent model. All right, so how does this now matter? What, what are the outcomes of that? And to kind of go through the facts we, we, I showed you in the beginning, it is uh, helpful to kind of derive the aggregate IS equation, which looks super standard. You have an output as a function of expected output tomorrow and the real interest rate. But we have two new coefficients that show up. One is Psi F and one is Psi C. So Psi C tells you how sensitive output is to changes in the real interest rate for a given expected output tomorrow. And it crucially depends on this chi parameter, this business cycle exposure. And it turns out that when chi is larger than one, we get amplification, we get a Psi C that is larger than one, so conventional monetary policy is, is more effective 
I mean, in simulating current, uh, current output compared to the representative H model. What, what, is, what is kind of behind that result? So think of a one-time decrease in the normal interest rate. Now, the unconstrained households, they directly respond to that, right? This is standard intertemporal substitution. They want to save less, consume more. Now, because this will affect through labor markets, the hand-to-mouth households, their income actually increases by more than, than one for one. And because they have high MBCs, they will increase their consumption, and we get this strong in some, uh, consumption increase. So it's really this, this interaction that they're more exposed, and they spend all of that that gives you this amplification. So it's really an amplification through general equilibrium. We actually do uh, an analytical decomposition into general and partial equilibrium effects and find that about for a realistic calibration, for about 70% is due to indirect effects in line with, for example, the kaplan molviolante uh, Hank model. All right, so now you might have guessed it that the psi f, the other term, uh, the other new coefficient, will matter for forward guidance, of course. And well, before going into that, let me show you how this psi f looks like. And now you see how kind of the, the two frictions start to interact. We have that the cognitive discounting not just applies to kind of the overall effect, which is this one over there, but it will also affect the precautionary savings dynamics. Even though you are fully rational with respect to the type switching probability, when there's an aggregate shock, you kind of cognitively discount what will happen to me in that state. And this is the second term. You see the type switching probability, 1 minus s, comes in. And then once you are hand to mouth, chi determines what your consumption will be. So this is really the same direction. Both of them are cognitively discounted. So think of a forward guidance shock. There's an announcement today that the interest rate in K periods ahead will decrease in a one-time fashion. Now, you expect that in that period there will be a boom, inflation expectations go up, and you want to smooth consumption, so you want to consume already a lot today. Now, through the heterogeneity part, you as an unconstrained household, you actually expect to overly benefit from that boom if you become hand-to-mouth in that period, because then you will be overly exposed to that boom, and you actually decrease your precautionary savings, which makes it even worse. And you already can see the tension here. However, with cognitive discount, you cognitively discount both of these effects, and it turns out that you actually resolve the forward guidance puzzle in basically all parameterizations of the model. And this is not the case with rational expectations. With rational expectations, you will get an aggravation of the forward guidance puzzle as long as you have chi larger than one. And I can show you, uh, let me show you this graphically. So here, for simplicity, we will fo focus on real rate changes instead of nominal rate changes, and then the representative H model just gives you a constant line. It, independent of when the shock will, will take place, the effect is always the same. Now in the rational Hank model, you get amplification of convention shocks, of shocks that take place now, through these GE effects, but you get a very strong forward guidance puzzle. Well, okay, maybe we can just set chi smaller than one. Well, then you indeed resolve the forward guidance puzzle, because now the precautionary savings actually increase, but then you get this GE dampening, and you have to assume counterfactually that these high MBC households are less exposed to getting income fluctuations. In the behavioral model, on the other hand, we have both. We have the initial amplification and the resolution of the forward guidance puzzle. Yeah, I just said that. Okay, so these are the three facts. The fourth one, the stability at the lower bound. I don't have time, but I think Nigel did a good job in explaining that, and the reasoning is quite similar. We also get that. We have a couple of more results, but let me talk now briefly about the quantitative model. In the quantitative model, the idea is kind of we take a standard incomplete market setup, with exante identical households that face an idiosyncratic productivity risk, endogenously binding borrowing constraints, and they can only self-insure. So there's no, no more of that full insurance within type and no more zero liquidity, but households simply save by uh, insuring themselves. And the way we introduce bounded rationality is now a bit more involved because now what matters for you is not just like the steady state, but the stationary equilibrium. Given your individual position of assets and productivity, where would I expect to be absent any aggregate shock is kind of where you would be in stationary equilibrium. This is your anchor value. But if there's an aggregate shock, a monetary or a forward guidance shock, you expect to deviate from that. And this is what you cognitively discount. So we try to capture the same idea as in the tractable model. If we set M to 1, we collapse to a standard one-asset Hank model. 
But we calibrate it again such that we get this sky larger than one, which we achieve by making sure that high productivity households receive a larger share of the dividend income. And yeah, we get the same result, looks exactly the same. Again, we also show that in the quantitative model, we have the same tension uh, in, in the rational model, which we resolve in the behavioral model. All right, so briefly about policy implications. We study a negative productivity shock that brings potential output down by 1% on impact with some persistency. We define potential output here as the output in the flexible, rational, representative agent model. We could also change that to being the Hank model. The, qualitatively speaking, what I will show you does not change. And now we compare the behavioral Hank model with the rational Hank model for different monetary regimes, which is what I want to focus on today. In one case, we fully stabilize inflation, and in the other case, we just follow some Taylor rule with a coefficient where we respond to inflation with 1.5. And we also have different fiscal regimes, but this is not for today. All right, so here's what we get. The red line is the, the rational Hank model, and the blue line is the behavioral Hank model. And you see the output gap is basically at zero, and inflation is exactly at zero by assumption. Super boring, right? Nothing, nothing fancy. All right, and this actually, this looks like divine coincidence, right? This would be the optimal policy in a representative agent model to, to that kind of shock. You could close the output gap and inflation at zero. However, to get there really differs across the two models. You need a much stronger increase in the normal interest rate in the behavioral model. And the reason is, as I tried to explain in the introduction, is you see that in the rational model, the interest rate increases slightly and it increases persistently. Now, the expected increases in the future are extremely powerful in bringing inflation down already today. But this is not the case in behavioral models, so you have to act more strongly, and therefore you get a strong increase in the normal interest rate. Now, by doing that, you increase the cost of government debt, leading to which is financed partially um, through issuing additional government debt, so we get a strong increase. And we get a strong increase in inequality, but it also reverses quite quickly because this is the case for progressive taxation. If we have um, less progressive taxes, actually would increase for quite some time the inequality. All right, with the Taylor rule, um, it looks quite different. You get an overshooting, you get a positive output gap, you get a lot of inflation, especially in the behavioral model, but also a strong decrease in inequality. Because now the redistribution does not simply happen through the interest rate, but through kind of the overheating. The overheating will redistribute to the, to the poorer households who are more exposed to these income fluctuations, and therefore you actually decrease inequality. All right, I know I'm should uh, wrap up. So um, in that paper, we provide this kind of new framework, which we call the behavioral hank, which can account for a couple of empirical facts and really uh, highlights the strong trade-off between price stability and kind of these spillover effects in terms of fiscal uh, sustainability and inequality. All right, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for the great for the great talk and very very concise and very and very precise at the same time. So any questions in the, the audience or uh, online, please, uh, Juha. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, I mean, my understanding is that in these hand-to-mouth uh, models, um, you need to calibrate the share of uh, hand-to-mouth uh, consumers relatively high. So does this uh, cognitive discounting do something for that uh, trade-off? So can you, like, match it to the aggregate data and then get it with a smaller share of hand-to-mouth consumers. Uh, the other question is related to um, <clears throat> this intertemporal elastic substitution. So uh, I don't know if it's possible to like calculate from your model sort of a general equilibrium uh, intertemporal elastic substitution at the aggregate. Mm -hmm. And you showed some examples from the simplified model. So do you have any like uh, idea that is it big or small? when you take into account all the general equilibrium mm -hmm. effects. Thanks. So why don't we go on with this uh, first, and, uh, and then we, because we don't have as much time, if you want to so respond directly. Respond? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the share of hand-to-mouth households, qu qualitatively speaking, does not matter for any of the results, because what really matters is the chi, is this, the, the income exposure. Um, but of course, if you, if you have more hand-to-mouth households, then you will drive up these amplification channels, and then it will be harder to, to kind of resolve the puzzles. You would need more of the behavioral friction, actually. 
Um, the second point about the, an aggregate um, IES. So, I mean, you can think of uh, uh, here the, the psi C times one over gamma as kind of a stand-in for the IES. However, what you, I mean, in the representative HML, you could also adjust the IES in order to get exactly that value, right? But then there are two issues with that. The first is that the transmission would be different. It would be through, again, through an indeterminate substitution channel and not these indirect effects. And also, for example, in terms of fiscal policy, whether you have large fiscal multipliers is independent here of, of the IES, whereas the psi C, the, the, the underlying heterogeneity wouldn't actually matter for these, for these kind of things. But I, get, I mean, you could bring that model to the data, estimate it, and see what would be the implied psi CO gamma and run the same estimation for representative age model. And, and, and I can't really tell you how they would, if they would substantially differ, yeah. Great. Any additional questions? I think, ah, can you come first? So thanks for it. Very interesting presentation. Uh, do you have any idea what optimal policy would do here, given these trade-offs? Or is, I mean, if you just speculate a little bit. Uh, I think Andreas will talk about optimal policy in Hank models uh, just after me. Um, so in the tractable model, absent the zero lower bound, you would actually have the same optimal policy, right? Because the Phillips, I mean, depending on whether you have behavioral rational, if you have rational firms, it would be exactly the same, but the implementation would be different. This is kind of also what we have on the policy implications that you can get these kind of divine co uh, coincidence results, but you would have a very different um, uh, kind of interest rate path. And then it depends on, on, for example, on the persistence of the shocks, right? Because if you, if you react very swiftly, you get a lot of, of amplification, but as soon as you try to smooth it out, the cognitive discounting will kick in, and then you may, may have to do more, as we have seen here. So, I, I, yeah, I can, that can only speculate. But, yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a very interesting paper. So I just have a comment, and perhaps you have some, uh, you can also comment back. So when I, in your very last slides, I think you were talking about um, consumption inequality and how progressive taxation uh, would, would address that, right? So, but doesn't that really depend on the source of uh, heterogeneity that you have in the model? So in, in your model, it's, it's income heterogeneity, right? And this brings me back to you know, the um, 2010 AR paper by Isabel Correa, right, where she says, if, if the main source of, of inequality is wealth inequality, like initial conditions in wealth, mm -hmm. then a flat tax, like a consumption tax, is actually m much more efficient than progressive taxation in addressing consumption inequality. Yeah. So would you be able to incorporate that in, the, in your Hank model? Would it substantially change any other conclusions? And just, just a thought for future work. Yeah, I guess, I mean, uh could maybe interpret it as kind of a permanent heterogeneity, uh, in a sense, or, or that, I mean, we also have wealth inequality, but um, yeah, I think we could incorporate that. One extension we have is where heter there's also heterogeneity in the behavioral bias, and we find actually in the data, and I think this is also in line with some of your work, that richer households, who tend to have higher IQs, um, seem to be more rational, seem to underreact a bit less, and then if you have a progressive tax system, this is actually much more effective because they now know, and they are almost, or they are fully rational, that they will have to pay taxes in the future, and then it's even more effective. On the other hand, if you start, if you pay, uh, if you tax poor households who are poor and constrained or not very forward looking, then this doesn't really do anything. Yeah. Any other comments? If no other comments, then thank you very much, uh, uh, Oliver, for the great, uh, for the great presentation. And uh, we can move to our third paper of the session and uh, a concluding paper uh, uh, of the conference, actually. So Andreas Schaub from the Toulouse School of Econ is presenting optimal monetary policies with, uh, again, heterogeneous uh, agents. Uh, so Andreas, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much for putting the paper on the program. This is joint work with Eduardo Davila. 
There is substantial heterogeneity in households' exposure to business cycle fluctuations. And at the same time, there is now a growing consensus that monetary policy itself has distributional consequences. Even the Fed is starting to increasingly take into account what you might call distributional considerations. And so the question we ask in this paper is, what are the implications of household heterogeneity for optimal monetary policy? In this paper, we develop a timeless Ramsey approach to jointly characterize three dimensions of optimal monetary policy design. Optimal long-run policy, time consistency and targeting rules, and stabilization policy. We then leverage our timeless Ramsey approach to systematically revisit the new Keynesian consensus on optimal monetary policy. And I have six main results for you today. First, under discretion, optimal policy now trades off aggregate stabilization against a novel redistribution motive. This new redistribution motive substantially exacerbates inflationary bias. And so there will be large gains from commitment here even in the absence of markup distortions. Under commitment, on the other hand, zero inflation remains the optimal long-run policy. We show that the standard inflation target now has to be augmented by distributional considerations. And importantly, on top of that, if you want monetary policy to be time consistent, we show that you need a second, a new, what we call distributional target in addition to the inflation target. Finally, divine coincidence fails in the presence of distributional considerations. And in the process of our analysis, we extend the increasingly popular sequence space apparatus to Ramsey problems and welfare analysis. Without further ado, let me jump into the model. Our model is a minimal departure from the standard representative agent New Keynesian model. We introduce incomplete markets and idiosyncratic earnings risk. And we model wage rigidity instead of price rigidity. Time is continuous. There are no aggregate, there's no aggregate risk. And so we focus on one-time unanticipated shocks. We allow for three types of such shocks, demand shocks, supply, and cost push shocks. Now some of the details. We define a household's private lifetime value or utility, V, as the expected net present value of all future instantaneous utility flows you. Households can trade a bond, and they receive income out of three sources. Financial income, where R is the real interest rate. Labor income, where Z captures earnings risk, and W is the real wage. And then a lump sum from the government tau, which in equilibrium will be zero. Out of this income, households consume and save and we denote the cross-sectional household distribution, which you can think of as this model's income and wealth distribution by G. On the labor market side, we take an off-the-shelf textbook model of labor unions and nominal wage rigidity. There will be labor rationing, so all households work the same amount of hours, and you get a standard New Keynesian wage Phillips curve. To walk you through this equation, epsilon over delta is the slope of the Phillips curve. And then what unions do in this setting is they target a desired markup over individual labor wedges. And tau L is an employment subsidy that can potentially offset the desired markup. On the production side, there is a representative firm that produces the final consumption good using only labor. We assume perfect competition and flexible prices. So the real wage will be equal to the marginal product of labor, which is TFP. And in general, in this economy, you will have wages being equal to marginal rates of transformation, but not necessarily to marginal rates of substitution. To close the model, the fiscal authority is stylized. It pays for the employment subsidy using a lump sum tax. And our focus will be on the monetary policy instrument, which is the entire path of nominal interest rates. The goods and bond markets clear, and the equilibrium definition is standard. And to summarize this economy, there are four sources of suboptimality here. The first two you are familiar with from the standard New Keynesian model, which are monopolistic competition and nominal rigidity. On top of that, in this setting, you have labor rationing, but then much more importantly, incomplete markets, which is what we really care about. That was the model, and I will now set up the planning problem and walk you through this somewhat carefully. 
we follow a primal approach, which means that the planner picks among those competitive equilibria that are implementable by monetary policy. We say that the standard primal Ramsey problem maximizes all households' instantaneous utility flows U aggregated in the cross-section according to some welfare weights omega. And for the talk today, I will focus on an equal-weighted utilitarian criterion, so I'm just going to set all of those omega to 1 in the following slides. Now, this planner faces five implementability conditions. Three are at the micro level. First, this planner internalizes households' private consumption and savings decisions, and those are encoded in the household's first order condition for consumption. Now, because on the right-hand side here, you have household's lifetime value V showing up, this planner also needs to internalize the definition of V, which is the individual Bellman equation. It's just the same in continuous time. It says value today is flow utility plus continuation value. And finally, crucially, this planner understands that a change in policy changes the evolution of the entire income and wealth distribution going forward. The distribution, the law of motion of that distribution in this economy is characterized by a Kolmogorov forward equation in continuous time. And so this final equation will also act as a constraint on the planning problem. At the macro level, you have the standard resource constraint and the Phillips curve, which I already showed you. And that summarizes the Ramsey problem. And we say that a Ramsey plan is a solution to this problem. And it comprises time paths for allocations and prices, policy, and multipliers. Great. So we've set up some machinery, and the rest will be results. We start with optimal monetary policy under discretion, because that already tells us a lot about the intuitive economic forces that will be at play here. We try to follow sort of the steps of Claire de Galli Gertler or the Galli textbook uh, in order. So we say that policy under discretion, when the planner acts under discretion, uh, the planner controls policy in the present, but takes the future as well as expectations as given. If you want to see some of the continuous time details here, I'll refer you to the paper. Our first result is an exact nonlinear targeting rule for optimal monetary policy under discretion. It tells us that optimal policy now trades off aggregate stabilization, which is encoded on the left-hand side in terms of the aggregate labor wedge, against a new redistribution motive on the right-hand side. And so this is really important. The key new economic force in this environment is a distributive, pecuniary effect of interest rate policy. What do we mean by this? Suppose the planner changes the interest rate. Then the planner redistributes dollars across households in proportion to their wealth level. That's the first term under the integral sign on the right-hand side, A. Households value that dollar redistribution according to their marginal value of wealth, which is just marginal utility. That's the second term under the integral sign. And so really, when changing interest rates, the planner redistributes utils across households in proportion to those terms. Now, you can easily show that the right-hand side integral is just the cross-sectional covariance between wealth and marginal utility. And that is negative because, and that's the whole point here, indebted households have high marginal utility. So to interpret this equation, you want to go from right to left. You have this distributive pecuniary effect, and the covariance is negative, so the right-hand side is negative. That tells you that at an optimum, policy under discretion wants to set the aggregate labor wedge on the left-hand side to also be negative. That corresponds to an overheated economy. In rank, in the rank limit, you can formally and easily show that there is no redistribution to be had, so the right-hand side drops out, and you're back to the standard case where you want to close the aggregate labor wedge and you get aggregate stabilization. Because this is so important, let me walk you through the intuition just one more time in a slightly different way. 
Suppose the planner in this economy is at a level of interest rates where the aggregate labor wedge is zero. So the aggregate economy is sort of stabilized. This tells us that at that level of interest rates, a utilitarian planner will find it valuable to further depress real interest rates because that helps indebted households. And in the standard New Keynesian model, how do you go about doing this? Well, you lower the nominal rate because that lowers with sticky wages here the real interest rate, which is what you actually care about for redistribution. But a side product of that will be to overheat the economy. If you assume isoelastic preferences, you can rewrite this targeting rule in an intuitive and illustrative fashion as a targeting rule for output gaps. It tells us that this planner wants to equalize output Y with natural output Y tilde up to two wedges. The first is the standard markup distortion wedge, which you know from the standard New Keynesian model. The second wedge is this new redistribution motive. What's useful here is that we can sign both of these terms unambiguously, and these are exact representations. In both Rank and Hank, the first term will be larger than one if the employment subsidy is insufficiently large. That's the standard result. In Rank, there's no redistribution to be had, but in Hank, this redistribution wedge is unambiguously larger than one. And so this tells us that under discretion, there is now a dual incentive for monetary policy to want to push output Y above natural output exposed. Now, in equilibrium, agents understand that this is happening. They understand that the planner has these incentives, and so the steady state will feature inflationary bias. Our next main result is that inflationary bias here now has two sources, the standard markup distortion source and this new redistribution source which quantitatively is substantial. It is four times as large as the standard term you know from the standard New Keynesian model. And so this tells us that in Hank, there are potentially large gains to be had from commitment even in the absence of markup distortions or if you have the appropriate employment subsidy, so to speak. These observations motivate looking at policy under commitment. And this is where we develop our timeless Ramsey approach, which I will illustrate for you using this graph. What I've shown you so far, so what I show you here is the allocation that these planners want to implement when there are no shocks. So think of steady, out of steady state. What I've shown you so far is inflationary bias under discretion. The standard term, which is the markup distortion, inflationary bias, I've normalized here to one, and this figure tells you that if you add a redistribution motive to this economy, inflationary bias is substantially larger. Now, the first step of our timeless Ramsey approach will be to characterize optimal long-run inflation policy. And we show that this planner under commitment wants inflation to be zero in the long run. That's the green line. The green line shows you the standard policy under this, or inflation under the standard Ramsey problem out of steady state. And so it tells us that under commitment, inflationary bias is resolved in the long run. But in the short run, and this is step two for us, you still have inflationary bias. Here's the intuition. <clears throat> this Ramsey planner faces two forward-looking implementability conditions, the Phillips curve and an entire cross-section of Euler equations. And so in the standard way, in the, for the standard reasons, this planner wants to make promises about the future because that affects behavior today. Now, at time zero, there are no such promises. There is no pre-commitment under the standard Ramsey problem, and so you get time inconsistency for two reasons now, Phillips curve and Euler equations. That's why at time zero, that's the green line, this Ramsey planner will still have an incentive to overheat the economy and generate inflation. And so the question we now ask is, can we design a targeting rule such that the planner internalizes these incentives and you get the blue line, which we're going to refer to as the timeless Ramsey problem? And that's what I'm going to show you now. The key object for us is what we call timeless penalties. We define them as T, and they comprise a distributional target and an inflation target. And for those of you who spend time thinking about recursive multipliers, 
we generalize Marcet Marimont's recursive multiplier approach here to continuous time heterogeneous agent economies. So we define the timeless primal Ramsey problem as maximizing the standard Lagrangian from the standard problem L, and then you just put this penalty, this new penalty on top of it. That's like saying you have a central bank, you give the central bank the standard problem, but then you add an inflation target on top, except here it's now just a little bit more complicated. The formal result then is to say, policy under this timeless primal Ramsey problem will in fact be time consistent. And that's where you get the blue line in the figure of the previous slide that just stays at zero in the absence of shocks. Now on the next two slides, I'm gonna show you exactly what this target or what these two targets look like. Our first result is that the first part of the timeless penalty is an inflation target, and we can characterize it exactly analytically. And it takes the standard linear penalty form, as you might know from Walsh and the uh, literature following Barrow-Gordon. Now, what we color in red here on the right-hand side are what we call distributional wedges. In rank, those distributional wedges collapse, again, because there's no redistribution to be had. They become one. And so it's very easy to show using this formula that you get the standard result, which is suppose there is no markup distortion, suppose employment is efficient at steady state, there is no time consistency problem, so you don't need an inflation target. In Hank, this is not true. In Hank, these distributional wedges will generically uh, not be one. And so even with the correct employment subsidy, so to speak, you will need an inflation target that is now augmented by these distributional considerations. On top of that, and this is crucial, for policy to be time consistent, you also need to add this distributional target. And one of our main results is that this distributional target phi solves what we call a promise-keeping Kolmogorov forward equation. The intuition is super, super simple. Just like, you know, the standard time consistency problem on the Phillips curve with inflation, this planner wants to promise not to surprise redistribute in the future, but that promise is time inconsistent ex post. And so in order to make that kind of promise time consistent, you add a penalty. I'm plotting these penalties here for you, and you see that they become negative for indebted households, which is exactly saying, just like you penalize the policy under discretion, say, for raising inflation, you want to penalize policy under discretion uh, for redistributing to, towards indebted households, which makes all of this time consistent. Okay, what have we done so far? We've created a problem a timeless Ramsey problem that is fully time consistent and in the absence of shocks, you do not want to deviate from zero inflation policy out of steady state. That allows you to focus, and ice, focus on and isolate stabilization policy. Our next main result is an exact nonlinear targeting rule for optimal stabilization policy under commitment. It's again in the form of an output gap targeting rule. It tells us that you want to equalize output with natural output up to this uh, extra term, which is now again driven by distributional wedges. When they become one, it's again very easy to see from this formula, by just literally canceling out terms, that you get divine coincidence, which is the standard result. So I should say here that all the formulas I've shown you so far nest everything you know from Gully and Woodford. Everything is nested here, except we're generalizing all of that to Hank. So under divine coincidence, when the distributional wedges go away, for demand and TFP shocks, you find it optimal to close the inflation output gaps, but not so for cost push shocks. In Hank, divine coincidence generically fails because of distributional wedges. So there will always be a trade-off between inflation and output, or aggregate stabilization on the one hand, and distributional considerations on the other hand. And so another way to say this is, if you want to account for distributional considerations, say, as a central bank, that will always come at the cost of aggregate efficiency. Now, to implement all of this numerically and to make all of this operational, we extend the increasingly popular sequence space apparatus to Ramsey problems and optimal policy. Here are some of the details. I'll skip this in the interest of, slide, uh, t in the interest of time, but I'll uh, be happy to talk about it after. Using that apparatus, you can very efficiently compute optimal policy impulse responses. And with that, I'll conclude. 
This paper revisits the new Keynesian consensus on optimal monetary policy in Hank. Under discretion, we show that there is a new redistribution motive that substantially exacerbates inflationary bias. To study commitment, we develop a new timeless Ramsey approach that allows us to jointly characterize these three dimensions of policy design. And we show that to think about targeting rules that make policy time consistent actually becomes a lot more subtle in this setting. Finally, we extend the sequence-based apparatus to optimal policy problems. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for the a great presentation and uh, let's uh, open it to questions uh, please uh, get yeah, thanks for a very clear uh, presentation uh, i don't always understand as i told you yesterday these optimal policy exercise and hank models are, but this was very clear but uh, I had a, there are a couple of loose ends to me so uh, one was you say first of all this quantitative statement that this distributional thing is four times as large as the traditional wedge or the traditional, this traditional um, markup uh, thing that gives an incentive to, to, to um, excessively, to, to a high inflation. So where, this is a quantitative statement, so that must depend on some numbers that you plug in. So what are the keys? Yes. So that's... I'm using there, the standard, I'm using essentially as close to Gali calibration as possible. But what are the and keys? Then, I would just like to see like a table of the key parameters, so you yeah, can I don't have to estimate today. them in our nice uh, data, because that would be... In nice this paper, know. we will not estimate them no, but, using uh, nice with data. With our data, we can do it. So I would like to know what are the key parameters, just to have a look and see what they yep, look like. That's, in the that's data. a great comment. We can. Uh, look at and that. then uh, the second question was more. I don't get this. If you can go back to this, you have this proposition where you are um, uh, sort of changing the. Uh, you're, you're introducing this extra. There's, yes, this distributional target, exactly, these timeless penalties, that was the word. So what's the, why can't you just, uh, I, I struggle to understand, why can't you just uh, increase the inflation target? Why, why can't you just, why do you need to put like penal, why do you need to introduce a distributional target? Why can't you just change the weight on the inflation target or increase the inflation target? Why isn't there, isn't there one to one mapping in this model between the two and why? I didn't just didn't quite get that. So. Yeah, so it's very easy to see that there will never be a one-to-one -one mapping just because this distributional target is infinite dimensional here. Now what you can do is suppose you consider a stationary equilibrium, you can artificially set the penalty. You can art so think of we were talking to Jordi, so he made this great observation that suppose you have an employment subsidy. In the standard model, we know how to set the employment subsidy to make the Phillips curve problem go away. Suppose you just increase that employment subsidy to just make the planner indifferent to overheating out of steady state. You can do that, but that will not be equivalent to what I'm showing you here out of steady state. So suppose you do something along the lines of what you suggested, and then you hit that economy with a demand or a supply shock or a cost push. Then policies under the two approaches will not be the same because here you internalize the interaction between this redistribution motive with, with the incoming shock. So reverse engineering your one parameter target to be just right will not get you the same outcome. I think uh, Gaetano uh, had a question. Very interesting indeed. So like, uh, given that you have uh, employment subsidies on the table, could you also have some other form of subsidies to uh, like agents in the model on the table that would allow you to circumvent this additional time inconsistency problem that arises due to this distributional target? Yeah, so that's a great question and a, a great direction of questions. So the, the, the perspective we take in this paper is when you want to start thinking about optimal policy considerations with heterogeneous agents, there are many conceptual issues that are a little bit subtle. And what we're viewing this paper as doing is trying to be clear on some of those issues. So there is naturally a set of questions around what fiscal policy instruments would you need? What kind of spanning conditions would you need on fiscal policy to make all of this go away? We don't address that in this paper because that's not, that's not our focus. Uh, I don't want to speculate too much, but intuitively, unless you can 
um, unless you can, the, the planner per, always perceives a distribution of marginal utility, right? Suppose that distribution is not everyone has the same marginal utility, a permanent lifetime marginal utility, and suppose the planner has an aggregate policy instrument that affects this distribution, uh, then there will always be this kind of redistribution motive. So unless you can replicate that degenerate distribution with fiscal policy, I don't think that's going to fully resolve these issues. So I was trying to understand what is the feedback of the policy on the, so the, the monetary policy on the policies of the agents. Mm -hmm. And I had the impression that, so uh, I, that is not distortionary here, uh, redistribution as such. In the sense, imagine that there, there is some fundamental reason why we want inequality. Uh, for example, I don't know, uh, because of, participation incentives in, in, the, in, the, in the labor market, okay? If I don't give you enough uh, way, uh, income, you will not work and you are great at working, so we want that you work and we, we want some inequality, okay? Uh -huh. So I was wondering, so to which extent one can think to, about this issue having a desire for inequality? Yeah, so, so let me just be perfectly clear on what it is that we're doing and not doing. We are assuming a utilitarian objective for this planner, and you might think of this planner as being a central bank, which is extreme in the sense that that's not what's currently encoded in law, but we just want to understand how would policy, optimal policy change if you did have such considerations. Everything I've told you about inflationary bias due to a redistribution motive, um, all of these target considerations, all of that was under a utilitarian criterion. So this is, in a sense, the best that this utilitarian planner um, having these considerations can do in this setting. Uh, we don't, so, and now to your point, because this is a utilitarian planner, if I gave you lump sum cross-section lump sum taxes, you would want to fully redistribute. And we don't have a role for um, something in, along the lines of what you suggested, and I don't want to speculate in that direction. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, another question. Uh, now, you had a real wage rigidity in the model, uh, but if you consider about st more standard setup where you have the price rigidity, yep. so is it the case that uh, you would need to have even you say stronger weight on this uh, inflation target to undo the, the inflationary bias because of these redistributive effects? That's a very interesting question. So we did, f we did solve a first version of this model with price rigidity. Um, the main reason why we switch to wage rigidity honestly is because of tractability. It happens to kill aggregate profits and so that buys you a lot of tractability in our analytical characterizations. I don't have a good, I don't have a good uh, sense how the inflation target parameter would change in that setting. Um, I, I haven't worked that out, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm trying to, to understand the, the problem under, under this question, and, and maybe this is, this is a, a yep. stupid question. But I feel like, I mean, usually you have this, this problem, right, that the planner is, is basically playing, playing a game against mm -hmm. their own future selves. That's what we and, do. And, and is there a kind of an incentive here that the planner at any point in time is, is trying to actually redistribute even more in order to reduce future inequality because that will improve the commitment problem in the future? Because there is an endogenous state, right? There is a, this asset ac accumulation here. Yeah, um, so, so what we do is, in discrete time, it's very natural to think of the present as being period T and the future being periods T plus one onwards. Continuous time, that becomes just a little bit more subtle. What we do is we say the planner has commitment, just like a Ramsey planner would, over a time interval of length delta 
and then we take the limit as that delta goes to zero. Um, so to the, ex and, and the distribution is of course, the entire cross-sectional distribution is a state variable here. So to the extent that there are these um, considerations, they are accounted for here. Um, I haven't dug into exactly how they, they affect um, the results, but that's an interesting direction, yeah. Uh, is, there anything, is there anything in your model that says that this planner is called Central Bank? Uh, why don't we delegate the inflation target to fiscal policy maker? There's nothing like that in our model. We just have a planner. So you don't know who he is? We do not know who he is, yes. But so there is a very long literature going all the way back to Bear Gordon on delegation and how you want to think about delegating monetary policy to central banking. Uh, some of the main contributions are Walsh 95 and then a lot of work by Svensson. So here's a useful perspective on what we do. Suppose you revisit that literature from the perspective of our paper and you ask the question, I want to design a central bank that acts under discretion because we don't really know where commitment technology comes from, but the planner wants to hand the central bank a kind of mechanism or a kind of targeting framework that will implement the commitment solution. That's essentially what we're doing here. So if you think of these Walsh, Svensson type papers, on inflation targeting. That's exactly what we're doing here, and we're generalizing that to a world where the planner cares about distributional considerations. Now, I should also say, we have a companion paper where we think very carefully about how you want to decompose different normative considerations like aggregate efficiency, risk sharing, and redistribution. And we show how to formalize welfare criteria that shuts some of these down. So you could imagine writing a welfare criterion here or a mandate for the central bank formally that only cares about aggregate efficiency. Or for example, that only cares about aggregate efficiency plus risk sharing, but not say explicit redistribution. And so our next paper on this will likely be a combination of the two where we explore these issues and ask, suppose you have society caring about all sorts of normative considerations, but we might want to consider designing an independent central bank institution that cares about a subset of these considerations. For example, because fiscal policy might uh, be responsible for addressing the others. And then you can start thinking about some of these. Here, I'm just taking baby steps in that direction by starting with a plain utilitarian planner. Great, so we're actually exactly perfectly on time. So thank you very much, uh, Andreas, again, for the great uh, presentations. And given this is uh, the last talk and uh, crosses the conference, just wanted to take a brief minute to First of all, in the name of the whole organizing committee, Seppo, Michael, Juha, Eza, and myself, to thank you all for participating. You know, especially we had a very vibrant, I think, and active uh, discussion. Uh, as uh, is, uh, you know, custom for the conference, the papers are always very much not just at the frontier, but also foreseeing like what uh, the literature will do over the next over the next few years. So, thank you all for participating in that. And I would like to give a great thanks also to Rika, uh, who organized, uh, you know, the whole event. And uh, as I was uh, telling, and many of you also were telling me last night, this is, was one of the most kind of spotless and uh, best organized uh, sort of conferences we went, both before and after COVID. Mm -hmm. And also to the whole IT team here uh, at the museum, which did a really great, fantastic job. Uh, hybrid questions are always so complicated, as we have learned. Uh, during COVID, and uh, honestly, that was, that was completely spotless, so uh, uh, very great work. Uh, so as I think uh, Olli Rehn and uh, you also last night said, the cooperation between the CPR and the Bank of Finland in organizing the conference will ideally go on for many, many years going forward, so make sure you keep on writing great papers and, uh, and sending them here. This way, uh, we will uh, hope to see you all next year uh, for yet another conference. So. I think now we conclude with, uh, with lunch and uh, a round of applause to all the presenters for the great, uh, for the great work. Thank you very much uh, and uh, enjoy the lunch. <laughs>